Right, good morning. I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's 27th meeting in 2014. I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones, as I have just done, and other electronic devices. No apologies have been received. Um, item 1, item in private, I invite the Committee to agree to consider our approach to a legislative consent memorandum on the Serious Crime UK legislation under item 10 in private. Are you agreed? Item two is consideration of one affirmative instrument, the Draft Road Traffic Act 1988, prescribed limit Scotland regulations 2014. This instrument brings forward a reduction in drink driving limit. We heard evidence from Police Scotland, Scottish Health Action, alcohol problems, and Scotland's campaign against irresponsible drivers uh, on this last week. Now, welcome to the meeting Kenny McCaskill, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and Patrick Down, Policy Officer, Criminal Law and Licensing Division at the Scottish Government. And Cabinet Secretary, I believe you want to... Um, give a short opening statement and then we'll move on to the evidence. Thank you, convener. Okay. Committee members will be aware that the Scottish Government has long argued that the Scottish Parliament should have powers to legislate in matters relating to drink driving in Scotland. And the Scotland Act 2012 devolved the power to set the drink drive limit. And while we consider that this very limited transfer of power was a missed opportunity and this Parliament should have the power to set the penalties for drink driving and to consider differential drink driving limits, uh, for example, for young and novice drivers, we welcome the fact that we now have this power to make Scotland's roads safer through a lower limit. In March 2013, following our late 2012 consultation, where the majority of respondents offered support uh, for a, a lower limit, we confirmed our plans to lower the drink drive limit in Scotland from 80 milligrams to 50 milligrams of alcohol per 100 millilitres of blood. Some considerable time has elapsed since we announced our policies. We've had to engage with the UK government to provide what is called type approval of the evidential breath testing devices used by Police Scotland uh, so that these devices are suitably recognised as able to operate at the proposed lower limit. Members will be aware that the current drink drive limit has been enforced since the mid-1960s, and while social attitudes towards drink drivers have hardened over the years, the sad truth is that there remain a persistent minority who put their own lives and the lives of other road users at risk by getting behind the wheel after drinking alcohol. Figures show that around 1 in 10 deaths on Scotland's roads each year involve drivers over the legal limit. That is 20 deaths each year, 20 families devastated by the loss of a loved one. And I know that some have said that efforts should concentrate on enforcing the existing limit more strictly and that there's no need to reduce the drink drive limit. This ignores the scientific evidence that the risks of driving under the influence of alcohol start to increase well below the current legal limit. BMA evidence shows the relative risk of being involved in a road traffic crash for drivers with a reading of 80 milligrams per hundred uh, was 10 times higher than for drivers with a zero blood alcohol reading. The relative crash risk for drivers with a reading of 50 uh, per hundred millilitres was more than twice the level than for drivers with a zero blood alcohol reading. The independent review of drink and drug driving law conducted by Sir Peter North in 2010 concluded that reducing the drink drive limit from 80 to 50 will save lives. Applying his estimate to the Scottish population suggests that between 3 and 17 lives could be saved each year. And we consider that the current drink drive limit has had its day, reducing the limit to a lower level of 50 uh, to bring Scotland in line with most other European countries is the right approach and will make Scotland's roads safer. To ensure that drivers are aware that the lower limit is coming into effect, the Scottish Government will run a public information campaign from 17th November. This campaign is aimed at informing all adults of driving age in Scotland and will comprise of advertising on television, video on demand and radio, partnership and stakeholder engagement, field marketing, website updates, social media and PR, TV adverts will also be aired on ITV Borders, which broadcast to both the south of Scotland and the north of England. This will help raise awareness for drivers living close to the border who may travel into Scotland each day of work. And in finishing, I should add that whatever the limit, it should not be forgotten that alcohol at any level impairs driving. And our central message remains, don't drink and drive. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much. This is an evidence session, so questions to the Cabinet Secretary. Can I just say, first of all, I'm delighted it's ITV Borders are also getting it, because my constituents, I think, mm -hmm. Elaine's don't get STV in some parts. So, at, at last, we're getting information from the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament to our constituents. I think you would, yeah, you would agree that Fries is in the same position. Um, oh, <coughs> some glasses. Christian followed by Roderick followed by Elaine. Uh, 
to I just would like to know, you, you described the process, uh, how, you, how you got there, and it took maybe a certain time because you had to go back to Westminster and we had to look at what was devoted and what was reserved. Uh, if we want uh, to maybe accelerate the process, if there is more we could do or more you think we should do, as a, as a, what the Scottish Government should do, the Scottish Parliament should do to tackle drink driving, do you think there is maybe a reason, a good reason to look at uh, what's reserved and what's devolved and with matter beforehand, and maybe which, I would like you to tell us which of the reserves um, matters you would like to see devolved before we go further into this uh, uh, way of tackling drink driving. All of them, but uh, uh, that's a matter for others, and uh, we have been through the referendum. I think what we've done as a government is to do what we can. The only power that was involved was the power to lower the limit. Uh, it would be fair to say, I don't think it was uh, uh, as a matter of uh, secret, that the police had always hoped that reducing the limit would also tie in with uh, random breath testing. Now, I do know that Chief Superintendent Murray gave evidence last week that they do have uh, powers, and I think they pull over 20,000 drivers a month. But I think for the point of clarity, the police have obviously sought that. That's something that we would be happy to consult upon as a government, but we don't have the powers and we can't even go there. Equally, I did mention that uh, other jurisdictions have lower than 50. Uh, we think going below 50 would be problematic in terms of penalties, uh, of uh, disqualification. Uh, there are arguments to look at what's been done in Scandinavia, where between 20 and 50, I understand it's not an automatic disqualification. But again, we don't have those powers. There are things that we'd be happy to consider, happy that we'd be looking for the view of the committee, the view of consultees, as to whether we should look at differential limits for young drivers, for those in specialist occupations. After all, if you drive a plane or you take a train, uh, then you've got a current lower limit than even the incoming uh, driving limit of 50. So those are things that we'd be open for. But the only powers we have are the power to lower the limit. That saves lives. That's why we've done it. We'll take any additional powers and we will work with the police and with other stakeholders and in particular with yourselves to see what can do to make Scotland even safer. But if you're asking me off the top of the head, then clearly the things that spring to mind are random testing, which I think the police would welcome, and indeed, as I say, some opportunity to vary the penalties, which may give you the opportunity to look at lowering the limit even further to make our roads safer, and indeed targeting specific age groups or occupations. They would be a matter that we would consult on. As a government, we don't have a view, but we do know that whether it's the Institute of Advanced Motoring, whether it's the police, there are those who do think there are step changes that could be made. Yeah, and if we can get a bit detailed on that random testing, mm -hmm. uh, we heard from the independence of Dr. Perry that there were 15% uh, of French people mm -hmm. have been uh, uh, breath tested in, in, in their life. What's the percentage in Scotland? Do we know? I don't have that information. I don't know whether, I mean, given it's 20,000 a month, uh, I think it's a significant uh, number of drivers, and I'd imagine they're not all repeat. I can see what information we do have. I don't have it to hand. I would imagine a significant number of, of people have been tested uh, simply because come Christmas time there are uh, uh, various campaigns carried out by the police where vehicles are pulled over even if you're not tested. I think uh, what they're clearly doing is smelling for alcohol in the blood but equally now at any routine traffic incident if you're pulled over then the likelihood is you will be breath tested. Uh, so I think the percentage will be quite high and certainly I have to say I'm not aware of any considerable complaints. In fact, I'm not aware of any complaint, either at constituency level or indeed at ministerial level, of somebody saying that they've been inconvenienced. It'd be interesting to know the figures, mm -hmm. notwithstanding that, if you provided these 20,000 people mm -hmm. who are pulled over, how many, in fact, have tested and are positive. It'd be quite useful just to know that. Um, Roderick. perhaps worth recording that uh, at the present time only the United Kingdom and Malta and the European Union have uh, a limit of 80. So the reduction in the limit will certainly move us more into the mainstream in, in the European Union. But uh, my question is really in terms of the timetable for the public information campaign. You indicated that that would be commencing on the 17th of November. Um, and uh, the new limit, I believe, is supposed to take effect from the 5th of December. Do you think that's sufficient time to educate the public? I believe so. I think there's already a fair bit of awareness because of the 
investigation has been carried out by yourself because of the uh, uh, efforts being made by the police and by others. We would have been carrying out a Christmas anti-drink drive campaign anyway. I think this gives us the opportunity to some extent to piggyback onto it, to make it clear that it's perhaps a, not a Christmas like any other and that there are changes coming through. The TV and radio adverts will reach the reckon 88% of the adult population. As I recall, it's not simply ITV uh, borders, it's also Channel 4 in Scotland as well as uh, STV. Social media, which I think we all know is so much more important, will help disseminate the, me the message. We're liaising with Visit Scotland, who will inform potential visitors of the law change via their channels. Our own international facing channels will also carry out that. We're working with commercial organisations. Uh, for example, Tesco has agreed to take posters and collateral at 60 of their petrol stations from across Scotland, and I understand that ASDA, I think, are doing uh, likewise. Uh, Farmer Autocare is keen to support with dissemination of marketing material. Local authority comms teams have been contacted, and obviously other organisations, the Institute of Advanced Motorists, ROSPA, uh, and indeed Police Scotland. And indeed, uh, we're looking at working with others. Transport Scotland will be making information available in their overhead gantries on main roads. So I think every possible avenue and media of communication is being looked at internally in Scotland for those coming in from whatever uh, direction, whether they come into a airport, a ferry port or a station, information is there. Major retailers, as I say, we've got Tesco and Asda at the moment and I would hope that others will follow suit in terms of their uh, uh, petrol stations and elsewhere. So I think significant steps are being taken. I don't think anybody will be unaware that come the 5th of December, subject to the approval of committee and parliament, uh, that change is coming in. But I don't know if, Patrick, you want to add anything further? Uh, yeah, perhaps the, and the other thing I'd mention that hasn't come up in that quite long list, there is um, there's a 10-day roadshow sort of field marketing being planned at... Um, in, yeah, basically, it's intended to inform drivers and the wider public, and it's going to cover key locations across Scotland, including Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dumfries, Galashiels, Dundee, Aberdeen, Inverness, and Livingston, just to give members of the public in sort of areas with high footfall shopping centres a chance to find out about that if they haven't been watching the television or haven't seen it through social media or seen it in the newspapers. Okay, thank you. I'll thank let you. other members come in. Yeah. to you about that. <laughs> Il Elaine, is the Highlands and Islands included in any fair way? Just thought I... It um, was. Inverness is... Inverness, there. of course. It's not, it's not an island. It's not an island. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Elaine. It's the last time I looked, anyway. Uh, Elaine. Yes, I wondered, uh, in terms of the education programme, is there anything specifically aimed at the day after people have been out drinking, after, given that we're actually going into a period at Christmas and New Year when people probably drink a bit more heavily than they normally do and go out with friends in the evening? They may get the message, don't take your car, mm -hmm. but how we get a message out to people that you may not be safe to drive the following day? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a message that we've started to try and get across, even within mm. my tenure mm. as Justice Secretary. I think we look back and, you know, many years ago, it was all about what state you were in when you left the pub or the event that you were at. I think there's been a realisation over recent years, and indeed I think the statistics show the number of people who are breathalysed the following morning. So certainly over recent campaigns there has been considerable emphasis, not simply on not taking the car if you're going to the Christmas party or to some other function, but equally making sure that if you're going to be driving the following day, you've acted responsibly, or indeed, as I know many people who now work for bus companies, for example, in the city of Edinburgh, where random testing applies not just to drivers, but all who work for the company, uh, that perhaps even consider taking the day off if it's going to be a really good night as they <laughs> see it. Uh, so that's a matter uh, for the individual. I think we've raised awareness. Our emphasis is that, you know, you have to, you know, take responsibility for your actions. Uh, people have to be aware that alcohol remains in the bloodstream. And I saw the report, not simply from Chief Superintendent Murray, but obviously from Dr Rice uh, last week. Mm -hmm. So people have to think it through and act accordingly. The change we are making is not from 150 or 280, it's from 80 to 50. What we should remember is if perhaps somebody got out of their bed half an hour earlier, it wouldn't be the 50 limit that would be causing them problems. It would be the 80 limit. So I think these people should 
reflect that if they're going to have a good time, which we all want to, then perhaps it's not simply you don't take the car to the mm. function. Maybe you think about how you get to your work the following day. Mm. I'm also thinking about people who might be going Christmas shopping or that yeah. sort of thing, that they maybe need to be aware that if they go out in the morning that they might Absolutely. still be over the 50 limit and not to take yeah. your car out Christmas shopping the next morning. And, and that the police will be message. out. To yeah. mean, I think we're all aware in our own experience that the, the days of uh, police... Uh, stops uh, taking place simply in either peripheral routes or arterial routes going out of Edinburgh. They now take place within the city because uh, I think it's recognised that people think they can drive about within the city with impunity, but they might get stopped if they went out. That has all changed. And equally, these events take place not simply at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning. They also mm. take place as people are going into work. And that's how we have to be because we've got to keep people safe other people who are going Christmas shopping want mm. to be able to celebrate Christmas and not uh, suffer. Yeah. Thank you. Alison, followed by John Finney. Alison. Thank you. Um, last week we had some discussion around whether or not there should be a variation in the penalties as people kind of, um, you know, are perhaps just over the new limit. And I think Chief Superintendent Ian Murray was very clear um, that he felt that the penalty should still remain um, quite, quite a firm one, and he said that he didn't support any variation in penalties. I wonder, um, Cabinet Secretary, if you could explain why then the Crown Office um, is looking at the possibility of what they say some of the less serious drink driving cases being heard in lay magistrates' courts. Does that not send a mixed message? I don't believe so. I, I certainly support uh, Ian Murray on this. I think he's quite right. Whether the limit's 80 or the limit's 50, the limit is there. That's what people know. It's done for the reasons that, you know, we haven't changed the drink driving limits since the 60s. We've changed very little, yet cars are much more powerful. Uh, roads are much busier. We also know that alcohol's probably increased in strength. Whether it's a pint of beer or wine, the ABV has crept up from the 60s, so uh, we require to make this long overdue change. We wouldn't support any variation in terms of the mandatory disqualification of one year and certainly uh, three or more for a second disqualification within the period uh, of time. Uh, that's appropriate to send out the message. I think what we alluded to, and as with your colleague Christian, it would be whether there should be any additional limit per, and requirement, perhaps between 50, 20 and 50, where there might not be a desire for disqualification, but there might be a clear desire to show that it's unacceptable. It could be a, a yellow card, two strikes and you're out. It could be penalty points. That would be a matter for consideration. We would be open to that. We don't have a view as a government, but certainly operates well in Sweden. I think Mr Allard's clearly mentioned about young drivers or others, or indeed those in specialist occupations. So that's where we would go. With regard going to the JP courts, I think the changes were made through Scottish Court Service. I think those who are in JP positions have the appropriate powers. They should be used. There are less of them in terms of the courts, not necessarily the number of JPs. Uh, they serve Scottish justice with distinction, and I think it will be quite clear that they'll be able to deal with matters, and they have the powers to disqualify, and it will be mandatory except in the uh, rare and complex cases in which there can be challenges uh, to disqualification, but they are very few and far between in Scotland. And, and you're content that that doesn't send a mixed message then, that as, as soon as we've introduced um, this lower limit, then we start to change which court that you appear in. Do you not think that we should uh, maintain this? No, I think that's a matter for the Crown and, and for the okay. courts. I think what we've got, the appropriate disqualification. I think what we've also brought in recent years is the uh, forfeiture of the vehicle. Uh, people should be under no illusion. This is not simply the loss of a licence and you're off the road for a year. The consequences can be the loss of your employment. The consequences can be the economic damages and what happens to your home. It can be the loss of the vehicle new or old. Uh, they can be forfeited depending upon the reading and the criteria. We fully support the Crown on that and equally it seems to me whether some of the actions are imposed by a sheriff or imposed by a JP, those sanctions will se be severe. They'll be in public court and the opprobrium from the public will be equally, uh, as I say, significant. Thank you. Thank you. John Finney. The enforcement of this isn't exclusively down to road policing. However, we had a, a Chief Superintendent Murray here last week, and I asked him, in fact, the phrase was, Police Scotland more than up for this change, and Chief Superintendent Murray said, we are. We support the change fully, and we'll be ready to uh, implement it in the proposed date. Now, 
a somewhat sensitive matter in as much as it will definitely be flagged up as operational. If reports I've received are accurate, mm -hmm. and I've no reason to doubt them, that a centrally taken decision will mean that, for instance, in the Highlands Islands, after the early hours of the morning, there will be no road policing presence whatsoever. Indeed, there may well not be out with Glasgow and the mother will. Well, then, that will not only bring challenges about the enforcement of this legislation, but it would mail, mm -hmm. email, open up the trunk road network to travelling criminals. It's very important that police have the wherewithal and deploy in a manner that can enforce this legislation. I wonder would you agree with that? I certainly would. Uh, obviously, they are operational matters. I think you'll also find that, although they might be hubbed at some of these uh, uh, areas, the spokes that they travel down are extensive uh, and significant. Equally, there will be the uh, local area command. I think the biggest change to drink driving is not simply the enforcement by the police, which is vital, and to drive that home message, it's the attitude taken by the public, which is that it is entirely unacceptable and that they report it. But uh, I would expect the police to uh, act appropriately to ensure that law is enforced and that there is a visible police presence. Thank you very much. I know you'll be on the case anyway, if they're not, John, so there you are. Uh, that's the end of, I think, of... Oh, I beg your pardon, Margaret. Sorry, Margaret. Yes, really just, I suppose, an extension of, of that Cabinet Secretary. Mm -hmm. When Chief Superintendent Murray was here, he estimated, although he said data was, was mm -hmm. hard to come by, there would be likely to be a third more drink drivers um, found in the initial phase. Now, obviously, that is a burden on, on resources, uh, for other policing uh, as well, again, I suppose it's much the same question. Has some thought been given to how that's all going to be managed? Well, yes, uh, we have thought, and those are the current statistics, and I saw Chief Superintendent Murray's evidence. I have to say also, though, we've looked at what happened in the Republic of Ireland, where they changed, I think it was in 2011, and they made the same change, as was uh, mentioned by one of your colleagues earlier. It's, I think it was uh, Rod Campbell. It's only the UK and Malta. Uh, the Republic of Ireland used to be at 80, but they reduced, I think, in 2011, their drink driving limit to the 50 that we are now proposing that we go to. Actually, what happened is that the number of drink driving convictions went down. I think the received wisdom from Ireland was it provided greater clarity to people. And rather than the number of convictions going up, as on a statistical basis here in Scotland, the opposite happened. They've gone down, and as I understand, they've continued to go down, because I think what they had was a campaign. It drove home a message. If you're going out, don't drink and drive. It stopped those people who said, well, maybe I can have a couple, maybe I can have one more if I have a cup of coffee, all that ended. So the raw stats that were provided by Chief Superintendent Murray are correct. Equally, the proof of the pudding, uh, the practical delivery of this from Ireland, and I think in many instances, many ways, even the culture, the demography of Ireland with rural areas ties in with Scotland, actually it went down because it drove home a message to people. Don't drink and drive. Did everybody heed that warning? No. People who flouted it got dealt with, but less did because more took on board the message, don't drink and drive. I think the point was that's over time, it's the initial phase where I think um, Chief Superintendent Maxwell was saying that the numbers are likely to be high until this message really does percolate down and people realise. So it's the, the resourcing for that initial uh, period where um, there are likely to be more drink drivers. Um, but th these are the statistics from 2011 through to 2014. In Ireland, it was immediate. As soon as they brought it in, conviction started to go down. Mm -hmm. Not because the Guard were not enforcing it, uh, but because people were heeding the warnings. So I think the practical delivery in Ireland was that people took it on board. Once the limit went down, People stopped taking a risk, stopped simply thinking I'll be within the margin of error or whatever, which they weren't. And that's why, as I say, not simply in 2011, but I think a year after that, it has continued to decline. So your worry about initial thing did not happen in Ireland. The message went out, presumably saying to what we're doing, the limit's going down, don't drink and drive. More people adhered to that. But I do have the raw stats, and we are prepared and able to deal with that. But I do think that the message from Ireland is... You make this change, most people take it on board. The small minority who don't listen to the law, whether 80 or 50, face the consequences of their actions. But perhaps more people who might have, through stupidity or just not taking it on board, actually thought a bit, 
a bit more, but thought a, th a bit more deeply, and either did not take the car, did not take that drink, or perhaps, as Elaine Murray was alluding to, uh, gave consideration to what they did the following morning. So you're really dismissing this um, third that was um, given in evidence no, last I, week as I, not I'm not dim issue. dismissing it. I'm referring to the clear statistical parallel from the Republic of Ireland, which they did exactly the same change that we proposed to do. Their received wisdom would have been that more people would be caught because there's more people who were, you know, between 50 and beyond the upper limit before the body cannot take it any more than 80. But in reality, what happened was less people were caught because more people adhered to the law and didn't risk it. I would, I would hope even with that, um, that this would be thought as a possibility that it may not get through immediately and there may be more. And the resources were looked at um, throughout the, the kind of policing duties to make sure nothing was being um, overlooked. Well, I can give you an assurance that Crown Police and indeed Court Service you know, feel capable of dealing with the circumstances that will arise. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That ends the Oh, sorry, John. Uh, I'm not too sure, Cabinet Secretary, if I picked up right there, but if, you know, Chief Inspector Murray is saying that perhaps there could be a third more maybe caught under this uh, by reducing the limit, is that because they're going to put additional resource on to catch people who may be over a limit, or will, be, will, will they still be working with the same resource? Uh, no. Uh, uh, what Chief uh, Superintendent Murray has done is simply try to work out those who are, I think, between 50 and 80, uh, and therefore more likely to be uh, caught. So it's been an extrapolation from the raw statistics. But can I give you the information in Ireland? I think... Uh, I'm not 2007, 19,848 statistics. 20, 2010, 12,602. 2011, and the lower limit uh, was enforced from 28th October, it had gone down to 10,575. From 28th October 2011, the exact year to, until 27th October 2012, the limit fair, uh, the numbers convicted fell to 9,771. So you were down almost 5,000 from the year in which there would have been a clear matter before that. There was a reduction from the year when it came in in October. So there was a significant drop. So I take cognizance of everything that Chief Superintendent Murray has said. We've spoken to Crown Police and uh, the courts. We're able to deal with that, but he's taken the raw data. I think the example in practice, Ireland went exactly the same way. We're doing what they're doing, and I think people take it on board, and the reference, I think, there is clear. Uh, it fell, you know. And if I can add, the, the note I've also got, although there had been a decline in the number of arrests in all but one age group category, I think that was females aged 58 to 67, a significant number of drink driving cases involved a male driver driving late at night, early morning, particularly weekends. So I think what they have done was get the message across. And I think what we're continuing, we don't want to see more people convicted. What we want to see is lives saved and our roads safer. And I think what Ireland has done and what the rest of Europe, other than the UK and Malta, has done has made it clearer for people. You can't go out and say, I'll have two pints, and then I've had a meal, so I'll have three pints. Well, I'll stay for a bit of the dance, so I'll have a glass of wine. And I'll be all right because I've done some calculations in my head. Just don't do it. That seems to have been the message in the Republic of Ireland. I'm looking in case there's any other late uh, requests. Mm -hmm. Time I move on, somebody puts their hand up. That's the end of the evidence session. I move on to item three, which is the formal debate and the motion to approve the instrument considered. Um, I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move motion S4M11277 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Draft Road Traffic Act 1988 prescribed limit Scotland regulations 2014 be approved. Formally moved. Do any members wish to speak in the debate on the motion? No. Um, the question is that motion S4M11277 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? As members are aware, we are required to report on all affirmative instruments. We have the opportunity to sign off our report next week. Okay? And move on. I suspend just for a couple of minutes just to let the officials change places. Thanks, Patrick.
Right, the next item is consideration of a further affirmative instrument, the draft mutual recognition of criminal financial penalties in the European Union, Scotland, number one, order 2014. And we've got the Cabinet Secretary still, and I welcome Scottish Government officials Neil Watt, Head of EU Implementation Team in Criminal Justice Division, and Neil Robertson, EU Policy Manager in the same team. You've got to be called Neil to be in this. Seems to be the case. What well, happens? Do you say Neil 1, Neil 2? Who knows who's been asked anything? Don't answer. Uh, anyway, the Cabinet Secretary will again give evidence, recall, on, on the debate on this instrument, and I understand you wish to make a short opening statement, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. This statutory instrument improves the original transposition of the Mutual Recognition of Financial Penalties Framework decision. The purpose of the 2005 Framework decision is to ensure consistency in the way financial penalties operate across the EU. It enables Scottish fines and fixed penalties, for example, for road traffic offences of €70 Euros or over, to be enforced elsewhere in the EU and vice versa. The aim here is to make sure Scotland is not seen as an attractive destination for criminals. Confident fines won't follow them here. Members might ask why we're amending the original transposition from 2009, and there are two reasons. Firstly, as with all new measures, there's always an element of seeing how they work in practice, and since the original transposition, we've identified a few minor problems with the existing implementation, for example, delays caused by incomplete or unsigned requests by other member states. In making minor practical adjustments to the original provisions, we can address these. And secondly, one of the measures the UK expects to <coughs> opt back into on 1st December, the Trials in Absentia Framework decision, amends the original 2005 Mutual Recognition of Financial Penalties Framework decision. We have taken the opportunity to improve the original transposition before we implement the new requirements on 1st December. Despite the uncertainty around the opt-in, my officials and I have updated the committee as much as we can on all the measures in which we are participating, and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions from members? How, how often is this used? Do we have stats? I mean, it seems to be... Ah, I've got one of the Neils out here. <laughs> it's got to rattle through his papers. I think between... Over the last five years, we're talking about 100... A hundred of these. About 100 financial penalties. And are these coming from abroad to here or from Scotland abroad? Uh, both. Um, and the majority are, are road, road traffic offences like commercial... Uh, lorries and, uh, and tourist drivers as well. I just thought I'd ask because I was just making sure you knew. Um, now that we move on, oh, you've got a question. <coughs> just, just, just a slight question. It was just something that uh, came to mind in regards to the cap sec about the opt in and opt out. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there's a number of areas here in EU law where Westminster is, you know, deliberating. You might call about either opting in or staying out. Uh, have we had any confirmation that we will definitely be opting into this particular part of the framework? Not formal confirmation as such. I think the jungle drums and the uh, runes, etc., are read, and we've had some suggestion <laughs> that everything seems to be getting sorted. But whether it's on this particular aspect or on the European arrest warrant, we remain okay. concerned. Okay. Your question this afternoon about it. <laughs> Thank, thank you. <laughs> I wasn't preempting it. I, I just, uh, I think the committee uh, certainly is a bit concerned about the EU, you know, and the opt-in and opt-outs. And this is yeah. just another one of them, basically. Thank you. That's, That's all right. Uh, now move on to item five: formal date the motion to approve the instrument. Consider invite the cabinet secretary to move motion S four M one one two seven eight. The Justice Committee commends the draft mutual recognition of criminal financial penalties in the European Union, Scotland, number one, order twenty fourteen, be approved. Moved. Mm -hmm. Any members wish to speak in the debate? No. The question is that motion S4M11278 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Again, as members are aware, required to report on all affirmative instruments, are you content to delegate responsible for me to sign off this report? Yep. Thank you very much. I'm going to now suspend for, I think, just a couple of minutes so we can rattle on as we move on to item six.
On uh, item six, draft budget scrutiny. Uh, this we're looking at the police budget as we decided to do, and we have two panels of witnesses. And I welcome to our first panel of witnesses, Mr. Derek Penman, Magistrate Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, Ms. Tina Yule, Lead Inspector, HM Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland. And I'll go straight to questions from members, please. John. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, panel. Morning, Mr. Penman. I don't know if you overheard the previous uh, input at all, Mr. Mr. Penman. I wonder the extent to which, uh, and I understand that it's a drawdown that the, the Chief Constable does of, of finance rather than there's a, a drawer full of money at Police Scotland, um, but the extent to which uh, there's any devolution of budgetary decisions within the Scottish Police Service at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. There we are. Sorry. No, no, thank you for that. My understanding is there is um, limited budget accountability that's passed to divisional commanders um, for some sort of general running of uh, their division. The, the main budgets, which are mainly staff uh, budgets, aren't devolved. They are held centrally at the moment. So there are um, an overtime budget would be devolved to uh, local commanders. But in the main, the majority of the budgets are held centrally. And can I ask, would an overtime budget be devolved to a divisional commander for a central resource, if I can call it that? So road policing, dogs, whatever. My understanding is that overtime is devolved down and there's an allocation of overtime is given to each of the divisional commanders. So my uh, expectation would be that in terms of the national functions, so things like roads policing that would be done regionally or centrally, those budgets would be held by those divisional commanders that have a national portfolio. So in, in effect, if you have uh, regional uh, assets that belong to Operational Support Division, the Chief Superintendent for that area would hold that budget. If there were divisional resources that were working within the division, then they would be held by the divisional commander, is my understanding of it. So, for instance, road policing, and the question I posed to the, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice is, um, if my understanding is correct that at the beginning of next year there's an intention to rein back on the hours of coverage of road policing, ensuring that it's just, uh, as I understand, perhaps Glasgow, Edinburgh, and Motherwell, the motorway network that's going to be covered on a 24-hour basis. Are there any financial implications at divisional level for that? My understanding is that you have divisional road policing attached to the division, but I understand that they are also managed centrally, so it would be for the head of road policing, the chief superintendent of road policing nationally, would have control over these budgets. But to be honest, I'm not entirely cited in how it chunks down into the divisional budgets. So is there a road policing... And divisional road policing? There, there, there is divisional road policing that is attached to the division and there are trunk road policing, which are a regional national resource. So you, you have, if you like, um, it, it's delivered in, in, in two ways. So you have, within each of the division, they have their own road policing officers, but they are professionally managed by Police Scotland at the centre, um, if I'm explaining this well. So although they are attached to the division, they're professionally managed nationally. Um, from there. So they, they, they are directed by a division and they deal with divisional priorities, but they're effectively managed from the centre. And if it were the case, as I understand, that there were to be no road policing officers, for instance, in the Highlands and Islands and perhaps north of Perth after um, the early hours of the morning, would, you, would that be a good use of resources to your mind? Would that not open the door up for travelling criminals to take advantage of that situation out with the central belt? I see, I'm not cited on the proposals and any withdrawal from that. My understanding is that you would have, uh, you'd require to have an element of road policing coverage across the country um, uh, all the time uh, from that. So I'm, I'm not cited on what the balances would be. Obviously, the road policing also work in support with other units and local yes, police officers, and they too will be available in cities and, uh, and will be able to, to contribute towards policing. But I see, I'm not cited on what these proposals are, so it's difficult to comment. Well, you may not be able to tell us. It might just be that you, you obviously someone is giving you this information. But is this public information about these proposals? Is there some? No, it is. It is now. It is now. <laughs> oh, ah, ah, I think I worked that one out. Yes, even I can work that out. But it's not anywhere. It's, it's something, obviously, that you've been alerted This information to. has been raised with me, and it's a no, subject of, of great, great concern appreciate because that. it is about the relationship between divisional autonomy, yes. central division making, which, of course, has surfaced in other issues. If I can ask one general question, then, then, then um, Inspector, and that relates to the scope that there is. When we were looking at the formation of uh, Police Scotland, I asked questions about devolved resource management, and, of course, key to that is um, uh, um, the resource would be um, money. Is there any sign of that happening, or is there scope for that? 
I appreciate that a huge percentage of costs are staff costs and they are held centrally. My, my personal view, given the, the financial challenges that exist within Police Scotland to meet the savings that have to come through and the fact that 91 per cent of the budget currently is within staff costs, that at a time of transition, I think it's reasonable for these to be controlled from the centre. I would like to think that uh, once that becomes more, more stable uh, and there's a clear direction forward in terms of the policing model, that there should be some scope uh, at a divisional level to have more resource management. But I, I, I understand and absolutely support the need to have that control from the centre at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, John. Uh, Margaret. Yeah, good the miscellaneous budget um, has been reduced. And apparently, this is because the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and uh, the money available for transition uh, has been withdrawn because all the transition has been done. Is that the same for the police service? Uh, my, my understanding from the, the budget settlement that there is still police reform money within the, uh, the PCG budget, so there is still reform money within the budget for next year. Um, so, as far as I'm aware, there is still money for reform for the police budget. Well, in that case, um, the additional 1,000 officers, there's still a commitment for that. The police numbers have been retained, but clearly the number of police support staff have fallen quite dramatically. I think 2009 seemed to be the, the peak period, and it's fallen about 2,000 since then, which is a huge um, a, a huge number to, to be uh, dropping by. Do you think the workforce balance is correct? Um, my, my, my professional view is that there is a need to have a balanced workforce um, for Police Scotland, and that balanced workforce should be the correct number of police officers and the correct number of police staff uh, working in the right way in the right places uh, together. I think Police Scotland just now are, are going through that transformational change um, which is seeing them look to develop new structures as they move forward um, within there. So I, I think at, at the moment they're going through that transition. So, um, but my, my own view just now is it need to have a state where they have that balanced workforce. If I give you a specific, for example, licensing officers, um, we know that they've been downgraded. They did a very expert uh, job, a very uh, a job that um, that reflected their experience. Mm -hmm. They've been downgraded at a time when, obviously, alcohol and the consumption of alcohol, the sale of alcohol, drink driving, now new limits, are all very much to the forefront of police policy. What effect would that have? I see, I, I'm, we haven't inspected the licensing aspect of it, so I'm not well cited in the detail of, of those, um, those proposals. I, again, a high level for me it would be about Police Scotland identifying what are their requirements moving forward in terms of licensing, what are the new structures for them moving forward in terms of uh, if they had eight licensing departments before, what do they look like now moving forward into the new structure and then making sure that they have the work balance for them. Unfortunately, I, I can't comment specifically because I'm not cited and we haven't inspected uh, the, the licensing function. But does that not come within your remit then? Or? It, it does. What we, 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 we would do uh, in all the areas is we, we, we set up on a scrutiny programme uh, and we would be cited on the work we do through um, the transformational change that comes through from the Police Scotland through to the, um, the Scottish Police Authority. But it's not an area that we have specifically looked at in any detail that I, would offer, I could offer a comment on uh, in any detail with you. Well, that's a bit disappointing because I, I do feel it's germane. The police do a job um, front line, of course, a very uh, important job, but equally, if they don't have the support staff to support them in doing that job, then potentially the effectiveness of that is going to be eroded. And I can think of uh, licensing as being particularly important in that respect um, for licensing of um, various clubs, um, renewal of licensing, also the drink drive legislation that is just going through, I, I would imagine potentially would have an effect on backroom staff as well. What, what I can say is that I'm aware of Police Scotland in terms of they have established new regional units in terms of alcohol and violence reduction. Um, they have they sort of centralised their licensing function in terms of policy uh, from there. Um, the detail I'm not cited on is, is the mix that you're speaking about. Uh, I'm not aware of there being any issues escalated to us either through staff associations or Police Scotland or by the authority that is suggesting that there's, that there's any problem in relation to licensing or any capacity issues in relation to licensing uh, within Police Scotland, which is why 
we haven't seen necessary to look to, um, to inspect that. But what we are cited on um, through our processes would be any national changes that Police Scotland pull together, they would, if it involves workforce, they will produce a business case effectively for that. And that would then go through internal consultation, would then move into the Scottish Police Authority and their um, a HR committee. And we would have some sight of these reports going through. What I would say is that I'm not aware of any issues that have been raised around capacity in terms of licensing. I'm aware that changes have been made around alcohol and violence reduction, which in my view would be, have been quite impactful. So would there have to be an issue before you would look at it as an inspector of policing? Shouldn't it be a broad brush approach looking and shining a torch into every aspect of Police Scotland? I think that's probably what I'm saying but not saying very well. What we, what we do is we would look uh, across the piece, all the change that Police Scotland do. Tina is our lead inspector and, and Tina's role effectively is to work um, and watch what happens within Police Scotland in terms of the transformational change and also within the Police Authority. So if Police Scotland are developing new proposals for licensing, if you like, then they would be generated by a paper with a business case. If the staff were being changed around that and the mix was being changed, it would generate itself to, as a paper, it would then be marshaled through that process. What we would do is pick out anything that we thought was particularly risky in relation to that, and then we could perhaps look at that as part of our inspection process. We also have good links with the staff associations, with the unions, and again, my expectation would be if there were any particular areas that were, were, were causing concern, that we would be flagged would be flagged up to us, and because of our new inspection programme, we have opportunities throughout the year now to look at those things specifically. It was just in relation to your alcohol um, and licensing issue. I'm not cited on any issues uh, in relation to that that would have caused us to look deeper at it. Okay. If I could move on. Um, Please, continue. yes. Campaigns. Um, we've had doorstep sellers. We've had the uh, advertising of the 101 numbers, uh, Keep Safe Online. What budget does that come from? Police Scotland um, budgets, uh, generally uh, speaking, are, are mainly around the resources that are, are used, so the staff costs in the main. Uh, I'm not cited in the level of detail about where the budgets will be. There'll be some budgets will be held divisionally, whether there are overtime budgets that might support some of these campaigns. There might be some money will be released from the centre, but it, it's uh, probably it's a level of detail that, uh, yes. that again, I don't have uh, in relation to, to individual campaigns. It would vary, would be my, my, my take on that. In the main, most of these campaigns are about redeploying existing resources to do the work that's required for them. Some of that would require some overtime, eh, perhaps it should be released from overtime budgets that we bid for um, within Police Scotland, but perhaps a question yeah, the best, the better directed to, to Police Scotland around the detail of that. I suppose I'm looking more generally, campaigns, PR, advertising, anything that might come under that kind of budget. Where do we monitor that? Where do we see what's being spent on protecting um, Police Scotland's image and promoting Police Scotland's image? I'm going to ask you to come in and maybe just talk through some of the uh, the, the budget controls and budget processes, but, but in the main, each, each budget will have a departmental budget, effectively, yeah. um, that, that each of the, the, the directors will be responsible for, uh, and they'll be broken down functionally, would be my, my take on that. Um, and there's scrutiny with, for the budget internally within Police Scotland, and there's scrutiny externally by yeah. the FDA. I don't want you to surmise about this. I mean, forgive me using the word surmise, but I think maybe we'll ask Police Scotland where they, they, where they put that into the various budgets. It might be under miscellaneous, for example, we don't know, but I don't know so if I not expect the Chief Inspector to would know. would look at these budgets to see how, how much was being spent, if it was appropriate <laughs> in the amount that was being spent, exactly what it was being spent on? Yeah, the, the, the budgets that, that will come to the police authority effectively will be kind of rolled up high level budgets. There will be a, 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 a level of detail within those budgets that will be available that will show exactly what the spends are to each of these departments. So the communications department will have a salary budget, it will have a, a media budget, advertising budgets and things from there. But as I say, I don't have that level of, of detail uh, with me at the moment, other than to say again, the, the, there will be processes internally in Police Scotland to monitor that and that information will be available. So that's nothing you've cast your, your eye over, even the headline figure to see if you thought it was proportionate? We haven't up to now to see whether, again, it's something that it's an area that's flagged up to be of concern to us that we would look specifically at. What we do know is that the information would be accessible to us um, through just looking at the budget lines that exist. So we, we could find that information out if required. Um, we just haven't, actually, I don't have that detail with me at the moment. Okay, thank you. Yep, yep okay. Uh, Sandra followed by Christian. Thank, thank you very much, Kevin, and good, good morning. Uh, I just wanted to ask in, in regards to the Audit Scotland report, uh, which was a <coughs> police reform progress update 
2013, and it was in November, uh, not that long ago, and they recommended that the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland should work together to agree strategies for achieving uh, savings. Uh, have you seen any progress in this area? Uh, I've, I've got a couple of comments I'd like to make, but if you might... Um, yes, we have is a short answer. Obviously, um, we also link in with Audit Scotland on a regular basis, so we'll have meetings with Audit Scotland um, probably to identify areas that we would see would be common risk that we would want to, to scrutinise um, from there. What we are seeing now, and I'll ask Tina to give some detail uh, around that because she works specifically in an area, but we've been quite keen to try and identify where the changes are coming through, the transformational changes yes. that are coming through um, from that, and we've been looking to do some work around the corporate strategy in particular, and that's to look at, say, you know, where's the ICT budget being spent and what changes are being done in terms of the HR function, what's been done, but perhaps maybe pass over to Tina, if we can, just to give a, an overview of the transformation change. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, Audit Scotland's report specifically looked at financial strategy and identified some gaps and asked for more joint working in looking particularly forward. What we've seen is a much improved governance process around finance. We've seen the publication of Police Scotland's corporate strategy in March of this year, which sets out a fairly detailed financial plan I don't think we could call it a financial strategy because it's fairly short to medium term. And one of the areas of interest for us and Audit Scotland will be the forward financial mm. planning, which the SPA and Police Scotland are now engaged in, looking towards the publication of a new strategic policing plan from which the budgetary requirements will flow. They're starting that process of strategic planning now and will be supporting that with some more detailed financial planning. So we're quite aware that they have plans in place and have a good deal of identified savings for 15-16 moving forward. They still have a gap currently that they're looking at and working up these proposals for 15-16 now, but they have a good deal of savings already identified. Mm -hmm. So we're, we can give assurance and Audit Scotland will meet their own assurances through their yeah. annual accounts process, which will be published imminently. But we can give assurance from the point of view of planning, certainly into next year, and the early signs of the medium to longer term strategic planning, that that is now taking place. And they're well organised to do that. They've made the right financial assumptions going forward. They've done quite a lot of scenario planning as well on different public pay awards, inflation levels, other un potentially unknown um, statutory legislative pressures that might come along. So they've done as much as they can within the resources that they have just now. And we'll be keenly watching how that medium to longer term financial sustainability process goes forward from now on. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for that and the, the detail of, of your answer also. And it would be helpful if we could perhaps get an update from yourself and not just from Audit Scotland. I know it's about savings, but it's also about working together and uh, making, you know, better changes, I would have said, within the, the, the whole justice service. And I just wanted to flag up a couple which I'd picked up on and ask you if that's part of the, the working together uh, in regard to the budget and the money that's there and how it's transferred. I mean, there's one there for uh, 3.2 million transfer uh, to the SBA budget from the police central uh, budget. Uh, relating to specialised crime divisions and uh, Police Scotland, of Police Scotland. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that one. Did you look at that? And the other one, which I think we all welcomed in, in the committee, was uh, <clears throat> basically the transfer of custody health care to the NHS, which I think is a, a real improvement, and obviously the forensic medical services as well. Would that come in under your scrutiny as well about the transfer of monies uh, from budgets to budgets? Um, yeah, yes, they would at a very high level. Obviously, we've just um, completed our custody um, inspection and we made comment there about custody health care. So the £7.6 million um, from there was basically the cost to Police Scotland in relation to providing those services and that was then transferred to NHS partners to provide that for them. So that's probably a good example, I think, where something that was um, a, a cost absorbed by Police Scotland moved to NHS, the cost went with that and I think that's a good example in terms of working together rather than just sh shunting the cost yeah. is actually to transfer the money with it as well. I think that would be uh, a good example. But obviously we we'll link in with uh, the authority and Police Scotland and the government uh, around, around those kind of budget headings so we are cited on where the money has been spent. Mm. That, that's, thank you very much just now. Thank you, Chair. Question followed by Elaine, please. 
Um, I would like to explore uh, from a submission from the Scottish Police Federation that suggested that local authorities could engage with Police Scotland and dedicate funding to specialist support staff who need their communities. And rather than to fund additional police officers, I would like to know uh, what, what, what you're thinking on that and um, would you see more, and I know it's difficult because you're in transition period, but would you see maybe in the future a shared budget or maybe um, uh, letting uh, other partners like uh, third sector and why not private sector to get more involved in the kind of camping that uh, Margaret, was talking, Margaret Mitchell was talking about? Yeah, I, I, mean, I, th I think in, in principle there's a bit about Police Scotland having their budget set and that controls effectively the, the level of resource that they have. I think that it, it, it's, you know, the ability for uh, other partners to come alongside and fund that, so whether it's local authorities funding additional officers, um, I think would be healthy. Localism is one of the key uh, aspects of police reform, so if, if there's something there uh, around local authorities who might want to contribute and have officers doing specific tasks, then I think that is a, a, a discussion that's worth having. Uh, I think there's something generally moving forward about how do people work together uh, in, in place in local communities. So again, I, th I would welcome, uh, I think, in principle, the ability for other agencies to work with the police together around funding and sharing staff uh, for the benefit of those communities. Uh, thanks very much for the answer. And on the same view, I know it's difficult because you are just still in a period of transition and, and you need to, to, to be very clear where the money goes. But we've seen highlighted, for example, the money spent on, on football grounds, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and, and policing our, our football clubs. And it's seen that for a lot of public out there that the money is maybe uh, overspent or maybe the bills are not paid. And uh, have, have you... Have you tried to think in the future how you could maybe again uh, 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 part company uh, making sure what whatever money is be spent will be recovered? Yeah, again, probably a question best asked of Police Scotland and ourselves, because yeah. we would scrutinise them. But I think, again, perhaps just to give some reassurance, um, Police Scotland have pulled together a, a national policy around recharging um, around that, and also in terms of football grounds. I know they've worked particularly hard to see how do you actually minimise the number of officers required for football matches. I think, you know, previously uh, up in Aberdeen, some, some football matches actually with, with no policing yeah. uh, and moving it towards stewarding. So I think there's, there's definitely something there uh, for Police Scotland to make sure that they are able to support community events mm -hmm. um, and recharge as, as appropriate and I know they have a, a charging policy and again that's scrutinised by the police authority so there, are, there, are, there is a framework that would allow for recharging um, and there's also a scrutiny uh, of that to make sure it's been done appropriately but perhaps you know, more, more a question for Police Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Elaine followed by Roderick. Thank you. I wondered uh, that obviously uh, in terms of the reduction in the number of sports staff numbers there's been concerns expressed that uh, <clears throat> police officers might be involved in backfilling uh, uh, in order to uh, stepping in to do the functions that the sports staff otherwise would have done. I wondered in terms of your inspections whether you have uh, seen any evidence of backfilling taking place? Uh, not, not to a great extent from there, but I mean, we, we have obviously um, checked with Police Scotland uh, and the, the policy in relation to backfilling is that, well, there isn't one, there isn't a policy of backfilling, but there will be occasional backfilling if it's required to support the operational need. Um, it's something that we will be keen to monitor moving forward uh, through our inspection process. And again, we're quite keen to link in with the unions and staff associations in particular to see to what extent, if any, the backfilling takes place. When we were at our last inspection, which was in Fife, um, the really only evidence of backfilling we saw was um, officers who were providing cover for um, station counters. So where perhaps a member of support staff was temporarily unavailable, a police officer was um, providing that, that cover. Was that an unannounced mm. inspection? Mm. Um, no, um, we, we, we give, we give oh. notice, um, three months notice that we're, we're, we're going to come into an area. But, 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 no, I would, yeah, I, I would need to say that we, we don't say where we're going to be in that area and there was flexibility. So that, that was a staff officer who would be going out and popping in uh, around there. In, in fairness, I would say that Police Scotland have given a commitment for these offices to be opened. And my understanding is that they are doing that by backfilling uh, with police officers in them to, 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 to some extent. The other area where we've had some backfilling, perhaps Tina may want to comment, is in relation to custody. Um, from there, Tina led the, the custody, so perhaps I'll ask you to comment on that. Yes, we published our custody report in um, August, I think. Um, and in that, we looked quite extensively at the backfilling process. There's a balance of civilian 
PCSO staff working in custody and obviously officers. And there's a strong part of the actual resourcing model is to backfill from local policing using officers. Now, that's not specifically to fill for the civilian staff. It's to fill in for any custody officer, whether it be civilian or police, to maintain the levels that are required to provide suitable care and welfare to the prisoners that are, are the mm -hmm. detainees that are actually held. So there's a balance going on, and the pressure that we were actually seeing was from local policing being able to provide the resources to backfill for custody. So the pressures aren't necessarily attached to purely civilian staff. They can be across the piece, and it's about finding suitable backfill as well, because backfill isn't an automatic process. There have to be the right skills and training in place for some of these roles. So in custody, an untrained officer would not be suitable in terms of backfill. These, these officers go through fairly extensive training on the whole to undertake that role. So backfill can have quite a few dimensions in terms of covering for leave, sickness, or even just balance the need for female officers. For instance, one of the things that we found was there really wasn't enough female cover if there were female detainees held. So backfill has to be required from that. So there's an interdependence for backfill that we've seen across the piece. What we say is something that we are alert to. Police Scotland have now moved to their, their single HR system, so we would hope that they would be better placed to be able to monitor the extent to which backfilling was being done. And we're about to embark upon our inspection of Ayrshire, where we'll have a specific look at backfilling uh, at that point as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, isn't actually correct for it to be said that there is no policy of backfilling, because clearly there is a policy on backfilling when it's required. In the custody mm -hmm. setting, yes, the custody. we didn't actually call it backfilling. If, if, if you look at the report, we call it cover. It's a mm. cover arrangement that's actually part of the core resourcing model. So it's a cover arrangement rather than a backfill arrangement that's a standing arrangement between local policing. Because if mm -hmm. custody was resourced to cover permanently for all the sickness and annual leave, they would be over-resourced. So it's about that flexible resourcing model that Police Scotland's using, which is actually a degree of sophistication that we would commend in terms of that. But it also pre places pressure on both sides of that arrangement who are managing within their own resource set. Yeah, th thanks for that. Can I also ask about, um, we've always had the, the, the programme of closures of control rooms, uh, the attempted introduction of a common IT system. In your view, as, in terms of the, your inspection role, do you believe that this is working satisfactorily or do you have concerns about the resource that's available or the effectiveness of uh, the new control rooms, for example? Again, in, in, in quality control is one example where the project has been planned um, from that. There's an IC part of it. There's a, um, obviously there's the HR part of it through. It's been well uh, consulted upon. We, we've taken an interest on it to the basis of uh, as the service level has been maintained effectively, our, our call our call still being managed within the time. And from what we're seeing so far, that, that that's the case. Um, again, I'm going to be asking in terms of how the project's been managed. Do you have some sight of that through the work that you're doing? Yes, it should, come, it should come on automatically. Thank you. Um, yes, and there was a report to the Scottish Police Authority Board on Thursday giving a full update of exactly the progress on C3, and they're making very good progress. I think their most recent milestone was the interconnectivity of the Glasgow and Edinburgh control rooms, where calls can be transferred automatically between the two to allow plenty of um, resource and they are very carefully monitoring the impact particularly in, in places like mm. Dumfries and Galloway and they were scrutinised quite intensively I would have to say by the authority on the impact on the individual staff who were displaced by that move as well as our service levels for 101 and 999 being maintained in the Dumfries and Galloway area now that the service centre has actually moved. So they're monitoring both the benefits, the cost savings and the impact on individual staff quite carefully as part of C3 and actively engaging with the staff associations to manage that. In terms of the technology, that process is going very well as well. As I say, this interconnectivity between the two main centres so far in the central belt was a major ICT project that Again, we're impressed that they've managed to achieve that exactly on time as predicted. So there's a good assurance going forward that the process will continue apace as planned and be managed effectively. One of the concerns around that as well was people actually, if staff weren't local, they might not know where a place was, where there was an incident, if it's an unusual name, if it's 
you know, it's not uh, it's a remote rural location which may not, people may not be familiar with. Are you able to monitor whether or not there have been any problems with maybe police not being able to attend as quickly because there was uncertainty about where the incident was taking place? We're not personally monitoring that, but again, in the reporting process and the scrutiny process, we picked up that they were being scrutinised quite intensively for the number of complaints that are happening um, in terms of people not picking up and the amount of callbacks that they're doing to verify whether the, the um, resolution at first point of contact was working effectively, because ideally if it had to be referred on to someone else, mm -hmm. it's either a specialist call or they weren't able to resolve it because of that lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So they are monitoring that very carefully as well. So to make that sure. also has a resource implication. If that's yes, and again, um, Police Scotland and SPA can probably answer that in more detail. Yeah. I'm glad you keep mentioning resource. I, I mean, obviously there's an interaction, direct interaction between service levels and yeah. resourcing units to keep the focus on the resourcing. Is that you? Right. Roderick, followed by Alison, followed by John Pentland. Good morning. Um, I might, if I may, just take you to uh, your report, Local Policing Pilot Inspection of the Fife Division. Um, I'm particularly interested in the comments that you made about working hours of senior staff. And in that report, I note that you record concerns over resilience within the senior team, with all superintending ranks reporting they routinely worked between 50 and 60 hours per week. Um, you then referred to a survey of the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents and a representative of those in the next panel. Um, what I wanted to know from you was whether you thought this was a, you agreed that this was a pattern throughout Scotland and what uh, uh, impact, if any, or what, it has a reduction in funding made to this particular situation? Is it related in any way? It, I'm not sure if it's to do with the, the, the reduction in funding or some of it's just inevitability of new structures um, around there. There has been a drop in the number of superintendent ranks uh, across the country. There's also been a, a drop in the number of chief officer ranks across the country. So some of that responsibility, by definition, gets, gets pushed down um, onto uh, the divisional staff in particular. I, I think, again, it's just realising we're 18 months into uh, reform. I think there's an element of you know, um, new, new people undertaking new roles and new structures. Uh, and some of that, I think, is, is people working very hard to, to develop them and to maintain them. I think the point in our report was very much about the sustainability of that and just concerns that, that doesn't, you know, the long working hours doesn't become part of the culture, uh, either expected or, or, or needed. And our view is, again, Police Scotland need to, to make sure that their senior managers uh, have got the appropriate um, work balance uh, in relation to that and that they're, you know, that they're not being uh, constrained, if you like, to have to work long hours uh, because it's unrealistic expectations upon them. Okay, thank you. Um, you also referred, I think, to kind of morale issues, and I noticed there's a paragraph on describing the previous five constabularies having a family feel about it in the view of, of uh, officers and police staff, uh, and that those staff had felt a loss of identity within the division. But uh, whilst I think I can understand that, does that have any kind of financial aspect to it, you know, in your view? Um, Obviously, we took the opportunity. The first opportunity we could really was the local policing inspection at Fife, um, and we were quite keen to can understand um, staff morale. We're obviously, linking to staff associations as well. I think, as we said in the report, I think there's an inevitability around something that was once, um, in that case, Fife Constabulary, that moves into something else. Then there's just that change and uncertainty of change that would have a, uh, an impact on people um, uh, in terms of being unsettling for them. Um, we also picked up as well there were some issues around police pensions, which I think were, were causing some among staff in relation to that. Um, there's also the new structures and new approaches that are being rolled out. So when you mix all of that together, I think, you know, inevitable in, in some regards that when you have that much change on, on people who are in a kind of steady state before then, it will have an impact upon them. What we picked up on and what the recommendation for Police Scotland moving forward was uh, around really needing to speak to staff and actually in, engage with staff and make them part of the change process. And I think, you know, to our mind, if you can improve the engagement uh, of staff, then that will have a positive impact on morale. We were also keen that Police Scotland would look at their staff engagement survey uh, and bring that forward across the whole of, uh, of Scotland so that the organisation and the police authority can have some indication of um, what staff think and how they feel currently. And again, uh, and we're aware that that's work that Police Scotland and the authority will be doing uh, jointly in the spring of next year. 
But as to the extent to which it ties back to resources or a lack of resources, it's really difficult for us to pinpoint at that level because some of it, it may just be new structures, new structures that haven't yet been put in, things that haven't been communi communicated as well as it could be. So to, to actually tie it down specifically to uh, any kind of lack of resources is quite difficult for us to do. We're about to, to do some stuff in Ayrshire, so we'll look to try and, and, and see what morale issues there are uh, there. And that will be perhaps interesting because perhaps Ayrshire will be something that existed within Legacy Strathclyde if you like, um, from there, and uh, we'll be interested to sort of perhaps more steady state than the legacy forces might have been. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, finally, a, a separate question. Last year, our committee r recommended that budgets be dissolved, devolved down to local or even ward um, level to coincide with local and kind of uh, ward police plans. Um, have you seen any evidence in your, your investigations to date of uh, the devolution of budgets down to that local level? No, as I, as I said in my, my earlier comments, I think the only things that are devolved down meaningfully uh, would be overtime budgets um, from there. Uh, I, I, again, given the time that we are within Police Scotland, the constraints on um, the, the, the finance and need to control staffing levels centrally uh, and maintain minimum numbers of police officers, I, I think that it would be difficult to devolve some of that, that, those budgets down. I would hope that once it becomes, if you like, more steady state, that there would be opportunities to devolve budgets down from there. Another part of that, of course, is, is also aligning uh, resources towards priorities and having the ability to actually, you know, flexibility within commanders to, to devolve these resources in towards the areas uh, and priorities uh, locally. They can do that just now by directing officers to go and do that work, but in terms of actually tracking the money back to what gets spent against what priorities, that's also quite difficult to do just now. Okay, thank you. Alison, followed by John Pentland, please. You convener. Um, returning to your, your answer there about uh, staff morale, I mean, we know that morale continues to be low in the new force and, and the numbers leaving are higher than, the, than we would like. What, what risks do you think are facing the force in the f forthcoming year as it strives to make the, the, the additional savings that need to be made? And would you support calls for a review of the timetable for reform um, to allow the new service to take a more cautious and cooperative and perhaps inclusive um, approach uh, to the change? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that you know, Police Scotland has done remarkably well in balancing the budget in the, in the first year. Um, all the indications are that uh, in, in the current financial year that the budget will be certainly predicted to come in uh, on budget. But I suppose my, my view would be that in, in year three, the budget that uh, obviously you're considering just now, um, it, it becomes all together more challenging. Yeah. Um, effectively, the, the only, you know, when 91% of the police budget it relates to staff, then there's very limited flexibility would be my, my take on that um, from there. It, obviously, as well as having the, the savings that were um, inherited from reform, there's also additional cost pressure. So you add them together, it makes it all together more challenging. Um, I, I think the, the view of the Chief Constable, and I'm sure Police Scotland will speak for themselves in evidence, is it is becoming more challenging uh, as they, they move forward uh, in relation to that. But uh, I, I suppose from our perspective um, just now, it's just it's getting in behind what is the sustainable changes moving forward, how are they going to make their, their budget balance uh, in 2015-16, in, uh, uh, and that's a level of detail that we haven't yet seen uh, either, so it's probably quite, in general terms, it's quite difficult to comment as to how challenging that's going to be for them and what they intend to do. Uh, can I press you perhaps on, on what risks you think there are around that, and, and at what point uh, you might raise a flag and say, hey, wait a minute, we just need to slow down here? Yeah. I mean, the obvious risks are, are the extent to which, in order to make more savings, they have to um, potentially lose more staff um, from there, if that's where the savings would come from, or they would start to cut inappropriately into the other 10%, and that would then start to have an impact on operational effectiveness, and that would be obviously where we would be interested um, around that. How that would manifest itself in the main it would be around um, police performance it would be the most obvious uh, example. So where levels of service were starting to fall, public satisfaction levels were starting to fall, uh, would particularly uh, would be an area where that might uh, come in for us. I mean, what we would be keen to do is to work with Police Scotland to see where they intend making those changes and where the savings are coming from. And I, I think incumbent upon that is the police authority's role uh, in terms of holding the chief to account around what are the impact of the budget moving forward uh, and, and have some of these things discussed publicly would be helpful too. 
Um, are you aware at the moment of the levels of sickness absence and, uh, and are those being monitored? The, the, the sickness absence levels are, are monitored closely both internally by Police Scotland and also by the Police Authority. Uh, my understanding, I don't have the exact figures to hand, um, is that I think there are, there are increases in there, but I think the mo modest increases uh, are being seen in relation to, to absence management. But I, I know that they are being monitored closely um, within Police Scotland. Because they're a use useful litmus test of, 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 of the health of an organisation sometimes. Um, the other area I was interested to explore is we know that the closure of public counters in police, station, um, uh, in police stations and the emergency control rooms caused a lot of anger and, and there was only retrospective consultation. Um, do you think that budget pressures will lead to further centralisation and further change in the estate? And do you think that, the, have you seen any evidence that Police Scotland have learned the lessons of um, talking in advance of making these decisions? Yeah, probably a couple of things there. I know, I know that the estate strategy, so one of the areas to make significant savings on would be through the estate strategy um, that I know has been worked upon just now and we'll, we'll go to the authority. Uh, again, some of that might be about where the, police, you know, where the local police offices uh, continue to exist. I think some of that might be about Police Scotland being creative and rather than saying offices will close, it's about moving police offices into co-location in other areas, perhaps to save property costs but still being available to local communities. Um, so these are things that will be explored, I'm sure, by Police Scotland as they, as they look to develop savings. I think what is key, as you've alluded to, is that when these savings are being put forward, and, and, and they're, they're inevitably there will be difficult choices, I'm sure, uh, moving forward uh, within the, the budget, is that Police Scotland would uh, you know, meaningfully consult and engage with local authorities uh, in advance of that. And I know there has been a lot of discussion between the Chief Constable and the authority in relation to that consultation uh, process and, and the role particularly the authority would take uh, in working with local authorities. So I, I think in terms of, I know, having listened to Chief Constable, um, who spoke at the Police Authority meeting last week, you know, I, I think he identified himself that there are areas um, for him where obviously he could have consulted uh, more and he would, he would intend to consult more moving forward. Thank you. Just following on, Mr Payment, from the, the dialogue between uh, the, the local area commander along with the, the local authorities, as you're probably aware more and more the burdening of policing has fallen on to local authorities and I think a good example of that is the, the removal of traffic wardens and this has now been picked up or has been asked to be picked up by, by local authorities and I see the Scottish Police Federation have, have requested that rather than local authorities uh, put any additional funding towards police officers they're now requesting that they should put it towards support staff do you think that's right? Uh, I, I think the, the, the conversation needs to be had between local authorities and Police Scotland as to how they can best protect their communities uh, in, in that area. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, I don't want to be drawn into what gets funding where. I think if it's appropriate for that local authority and we're keen to, uh, to have empowerment of local, you know, local, local policing and empowerment of local commanders, then in some respects a, a dialogue between local authorities and the local commander uh, about how the local authority might support policing and might support that financially uh, is probably a conversation that would be, would be worth having. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to generalise in, in, in about where they would look to, to fund or, or, or not fund. But surely you, you will agree that local authorities are under, under the same financial uh, constraint as what Police Scotland is, so surely you must have a view that why, why, why should the local authority take up the burden of the efficiency cuts from Police Scotland? Yeah, I mean, I would take the view that they shouldn't would be my take. And I think the example I gave in health is where if, if, if um, you know, health care was, was taken a cost to policing, it was transferred to NHS and the cost went with it. So it wasn't cost shunting um, from that. So I think there's probably a principle around that. There is an, an aspect of things like traffic wardens about responsibility and legislation around, around some of that. I think the overarching bit for me in all of this is it's about meaningful engagement between Police Scotland and local authorities so that actually there's proper effective dialogue around what it is that is needing to be provided and who's best to provide it, as opposed to trying to be uh, shunt costs on, would be my take. Uh, as we all probably know, the Scottish Government has a commitment to the additional 1,000 police officers. Uh, now, moving in from Audit Scotland's report that you know uh, we have to be more focused on the strategic approach, do you think this figure is going to be sustainable? And uh, if it is sustainable, uh, where? I'm not so 
it's more of a political question rather than for Manchester. Sure. It might probably. you'd say it impacts on the budget, perhaps, yeah. if you could approach it that way. I think, I think way. it's probably quite relevant to the but discussion. It's a political a, well, decision yeah, rather may, than that, a... That may be your take on it. It's certainly not my take. Ma, 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 well, uh, it is a political decision. To the, do uh, so, <laughs> you know, we're asking if, uh, uh, you know, if that's sustainable, and, and if so, you know, obviously we've seen a significant impact on... Uh, the backroom staff. Uh, so my, my, my question, I suppose, is: Do you think that you know? Do you think the thousand police officers under the present financial climate is is, is going to be sustainable? I think it is challenging. Um, would be my take on that. It's where you have 91% uh, of your budget, as I said before, are staff costs, and then you have the flexibility within that. I think the thousand additional officers uh, is a good thing, in as much as you, you have additional officers on, on the street uh, and doing that, it, it continues to be a good thing, provided these 1,000 extra officers are, are being used for policing purposes. Um, I suppose the extent, if, if should should the number of police officers then be brought in to do other roles and they're less impactive, I think that is perhaps the point at which it becomes less sustainable uh, moving forward. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, John. Mr. Cameron, I have a question about uh, IT systems and accepting that there's a role for the authority um, but there's implications for the police. We understand capital reform, £10 million has been transferred from operating reform to meet the cost of ICT systems and I assume that's the helpfully named I-6 and C-3. Uh, are there any disasters looming that we need to know about, given the history of I ICT and the police service? I mean, obviously, I ICT, I think, in, in the public sector generally are, uh, is, is incredibly challenging. They need to try and uh, harmonise eight legacy systems into national systems is particularly challenging and, and, and particularly expensive, would be my take uh, on that. I think what we're seeing, uh, the major project is I-6 uh, around that, and um, I know that's been of interest to the committee. Uh, indications are um, that we're picking up from there. That it's a project that's been managed well, and although there is some slippage, uh, that's been taken um, care of, if you like, but uh, the project, uh, there's a high level of confidence currently about it being delivered um, for us. There's also additional ICT spend around things like C3, which is control room technology, and obviously we're seeing some of that now starting to be implemented. Um, I'll ask Tina, because Tina's been involved in the kind of ICT side with Police Scotland in terms of just what some of the governance arrangements are around ICT to give us some confidence. Yes, there's been quite an increase in governance around ICT, the SPA, um, have implemented an ICT scrutiny forum and are now introducing further reporting into their financial committee to monitor that capital spend, as you say, to improve further governance around exactly what is that capital money being spent on, are the projects delivering to time. But there's individual governance around each of the projects as well as the programme in total, the ICT programme, and a good proportion of reform money is being spent on ICT. Primarily because Police Scotland quite rightly recognise that ICT is a key enabler of transformational change that can support savings and I6 being their, their flagship programme. And they've actually managed to pull from initial issues with I6, um, perhaps with specification, they've genuinely pulled that back to a position now where they and their supplier are in a very good place with guaranteeing delivery to time scale. We're talking As to each other again, are they? Very good com communication and governance going on. Strong control being exhibited by Police Scotland in terms of adherence to, to milestones and withholding milestone payments until they're satisfied. They also have external assurance through consultancy and the independent gateway review process, as well as ourselves. So they're actually very well scrutinised now in terms of ICT and have a good deal of capacity in place to deliver the programme. However, we do believe that the capacity could increase for ICT in that if they want to further progress transformational change to deliver some of these challenging savings, ICT is one of the obvious paths, which would increase the, the pressure on both their ICT resources and that capital funding in the future. But it's for Police Scotland to say what other ICT programmes they want to bring forward in that case. OK, thank you both very much. Thank you. Christian. Thank you very much, Commander. I'll be very brief. I, I just wanted to know about the police pensions. Is, do you think it's the elephant in the room? Is it the, the, the biggest concern that you have, particularly under clarity of how much in 2015 and 2016 effectively we'll have on the budget? 
It's, it's probably a question I can't answer, to be honest, and probably one best directed to SPA and Police Scotland in terms of the, the finance director. My understanding is that the, the element of pension is taken out of the, 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 the operational budget, if you like, and it, it's met uh, from elsewhere. But um, So probably a question best directed to the directors of finance. Thank you. Thank you. Just as a final sort of question is, because we've got the SPA looking at the police budget and service delivery to an extent as well, and yourself doing it. And I wonder how the um, establishment of the SP has impacted on your role um, as the Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary and looking at budgets as well. Has that made a difference? Effectively, I think part of our role is to work effectively alongside the SPA in their scrutiny role and indeed Audit Scotland, because Audit Scotland also have a role in terms of uh, base value and police finance. So we have a memorandum understanding with Audit Scotland. So, for example, Audit, Audit Scotland will do the detailed work around financial accounting and will, uh, in terms of the annual accounts, uh, whether we will meet with them around financial risk. What we are looking to do just now, effectively, is, although we're not scrutinising um, the, the finance in terms of inspection activity, is we, we monitor the, you know, the, the budgets and how they're being done, and we actually um, work alongside or we, we sit in on the um, police authority meetings and also police Scotland meetings. So the budget papers are going through, the business cases for things that are going through uh, we see. So we're able to, if you like, um, comment on them or, or provide support. So I suppose that the, we don't duplicate that effectively. What we do is we just now is we we're pretty much working alongside and watching or supporting the police authority in terms of their governance of that rather than us duplicating. And if we identify areas of risk, then we can then pick up on them individually. If you identify uh, areas of risk for Police Scotland, is that what you're saying, yeah, or SPA? Which... Or both, effectively, because okay. the, effectively the, the, the SPA um, and the Chief Exec is, is accountable officer for, for the police budget. So, in, in, in some respects, the Director of Finance works closely with the, uh, the finance lead within SPA. So, again, we, we are cited on that because we, we, we attend and observe pr both private and public meetings of the SPA, so we can see how the, the budget is being governed. So, it gives us opportunity, if there's areas that we're concerned around, we could then look to go and do some scrutiny in that area, or indeed we could speak to Audit Scotland if it was more appropriate for them to do that. So, so it, it doesn't, we're not both doing the same thing. In some respects, what we're doing is watching SPA and how they are governing Police Scotland and how Police Scotland report to them. That's helpful because I was beginning to wonder, you know, if there's a lot of uh, cooks here, um, you know, uh, busily um, making the broth, as it were. But I see you're telling me you're complementary in a, a sense. Indeed, yeah. And it's effectively, it's, it's us helping the authority in a position where they can exert effective scrutiny, financial scrutiny with Police Scotland and the whole strategic management of Police Scotland. Um, because we're cited on that, then we, we can also take a view as to how effective yep. that is uh, and support it or inspect it, depending on what's needed. And maintain your independence. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for that. Right. I'm going to suspend for five minutes, and if you wish, is there a wish for a five-minute suspension? Yes. OK. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, back in business, I welcome to the meeting our second panel of witnesses, Chief Superintendent Niven Rennie, President Association of Scottish Police Superintendents, and Stevie Diamond, Police Staff Scotland Branch Unison. And as usual, I'll go straight to questions from members, please. Margaret. Could I... Uh, good, good, on. Sorry, good yes. Good morning. <laughs> Could I ask again about the, the police numbers? We, the police numbers are, are being protected, increased, but um, the support staff has, um, as far as I can see from the figures, decreased by about 2,035 since December 2009. Is the, the workforce uh, balance correct in your view? I've been here before, so you just indicate to me which one I'll call you. Mr Diamond. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's oh, you weren't <laughs> indicating? <laughs> yeah. Oh, was indi sorry, I was indicating, but I think my answer is no convenient. Right. <laughs> uh, absolutely not. Um, there's been much played about 17234, a political number that's been uh, uh, placed to maintain police officer numbers. But Police Scotland isn't 17234. Police Scotland at the moment is around 23,000 people, and that's 23,000 people delivering the service to the, the people of Scotland. Um, our view is that, uh, is that we should have a balanced workforce, that staff, our officers, are uh, assigned to the jobs that they're there to do. So we need some sort of review of the work that Police Scotland does to establish exactly how many police officers we need and how exactly how many staff we need to actually carry out the roles that Police Scotland are there to, is there to do. Um, can I ask more specifically, uh, well, perhaps if... if um I always get my ranks wrong, so I don't want to demote your promotion. Chief Superintendent. You all live in the hope, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the same question? Yeah, well, I, I think it's, I, I agree with Stephen that our association would, would tend to support uh, a balanced workforce. We have always, we've always argued that uh, it's always good to have as many police officers available to us as we can, and we've, we've thoroughly supported uh, the 17234 whilst it's been in. Uh, ongoing but I think I think there's a wider discussion than that uh, and I think it's it, it is really a, a political discussion is you know we we, we maintain a, our education budget at a flat line we, we increase our health budget but we cut justice and and you know that that, that is about prioritization it's right and proper that we do that but when when we make these cuts we can't expect the police to deliver the same service we have done if we're reducing the amount of money and reform has helped a transformational change will help but i think there has to be a realistic expectation of what we want the police to deliver and and when we do try and save money around the margins without reducing staff numbers then it becomes an issue about closing control rooms and, and closing police officers counters then we try to use our resources in different ways and then it becomes an issue about wearing firearms I think we need a wider discussion of what we expect the police to do and what we want the police to do and then fund appropriately. So you would also um, support a, a review of the, the workforce balance? Yes, I, I think uh, we've gone a long way over the years to stop having police officers uh, thinking they're architects or, or believing that they're lawyers. Uh, we actually employ people to do that. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, well, long may, long may it continue that we, we have the right people in the right jobs and, and, and the police officers use their warranted powers for the, the, the skill sets that they have. Okay. Can I ask you if, if you're aware of any particular issue with licensing where um, I think there's been a downgrading of staff and um, it's, it's an expert kind of job given how important alcohol is and the, the control of it at various levels. Are you aware of any issue there? Yes, uh, that, to be honest, that's quite a common theme throughout the restructuring of Police Scotland and that members of staff, it's just not a reduc the reduction in members of staff, it's actually a de-skilling of staff as well. Mm -hmm. And some of those roles that the staff uh, carry out are being given to uh, police officers to, to, to do that. Licensing is one example, but also, uh, for example, legal document serving, uh, which... Uh, uh, the serving of citations uh, to members of the public. Uh, the proposal for that was that there were, I think it was 69 uh, legal documents officers across Scotland. The proposal was to completely do away with that service and to put the serving of citations back to frontline police officers. Um, now, that proposal has been carried through, I think it implements in December. Um, but 
what we managed to do is to actually take the administrative part of the, the citation serve and the, the part where the citations are recorded, the, 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 some of them are time critical, and put that back into uh, back to police staff. However, that did involve again another uh, downgrading of their of their role. Uh, because they've obviously had the part where they're actually meeting members of the public taken from them, so that actually downgraded the role um, uh, one full grade. That's quite a common theme throughout it. So it's not just the fact that police staff numbers are, are decreasing, their roles are diminishing as well. Anything to add? Yeah, so I, again, I, I, I reiterate, you know, if 91% if of our budget goes on staff, and, and we have a huge amount of savings to make, then we're going to change the way we operate eh, to try and make these savings. And, and our members have felt the pain as well. We heard earlier from the HMI that our numbers have been reduced. Uh, and the work doesn't go away. Eh, so I, 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 in an ideal world, I think that we, we would have police officers, police officers wouldn't be serving citations, we'd have people doing it, but the savings have to be made somewhere. Eh, and as the budget gets cut, eh, more tough decisions have to be taken in that way. So I suppose really we're, we're looking at this balance, how much um, to, or to what extent these increased police officers or increased number are ensuring that police are doing the role we would traditionally expect them to use in prevention and, and detection of crime and, and taking on, if not actual physical back uh, filling, duties that are more associated with the support staff traditionally. Would that be a fair assessment? I think that uh, for a long time the police service have tried to, to meet all the public expectations uh, and there has to come a stage where we say we, we can't continue to operate. So we heard earlier on about traffic wardens. I think that was one appropriate discussion to say you know we can't be expected to fulfil everything that's required in society. Uh, even last week the Chief Constable at the, the SPA meeting uh, announced 100 extra officers uh, being uh, given to child abuse inquiries. <coughs> well, we, 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 we continue to create squads, we continue to meet the public expectation, uh, and at some point we're unable to do that, and I, I think that has to be a realistic expectation. Okay. Mr Tank? Uh, to be honest, I've, I've got to agree uh, with, with most of that. Um, however, uh, we have to have a look at the appropriateness of the roles. Uh, so if we have got 100 officers, why does it necessarily have to be 100 officers? Is, is there intelligence roles that, that are sitting that could be appropriately uh, carried out by members of staff, which would effectively free up the, the officers to do their warranted role? So uh, it's, it's, again, it's part of that bigger debate about how we actually go about policing uh, and the public's perception of, of, of what a, a frontline police officer is, as opposed to what support can be given to that officer to carry out their role. Right. Um, can I ask about campaigns as well? Are you aware of um, you know, any, uh, any increase in budget for, for campaigns impacting any way, some of them very positive, or PR or advertising or anything like that? Has that come across your, your members' um, desks at all? Just the, the amount of money spent on and this as opposed to perhaps more frontline um, uh, sort of direct policing? Yeah. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I don't have a, a, an idea of what the budget would be for campaigns. However, I think there's been much more intelligent use of things like social media and that in, in Police Scotland, uh, which, to be perfectly honest, are cheaper. Um, uh, but, so there, there is that, but that's not the be-all and end-all. Um, more positive communication, more face-to-face -face communication is probably as, as much a way to go as, uh, as um, uh, social media is. Not everyone is social media savvy, although we do place quite a, a heavy emphasis on it. Um, and sometimes uh, that interaction between a police officer on the street is much more positive. Uh, however, if there's a reduction in those numbers because they are, for want of a better word, backfilling the roles of members of staff, then that's obviously got a negative impact. Okay. Similarly, I, I don't have fingers, uh, fingers to my fingertips. But what I would do is say if we change to a 101 number, for example, for efficiency, then there's a need to publicise that so the public uses it. So there's quite an appropriate use of spend. I don't know the level. Okay, thank you. No, I've used it. It's very good. <laughs> I've used 101. <coughs> Somebody blocked my driveway and I couldn't get out for two hours. Um, next, please, Elaine, John Pentland, then Sandra. Could I um, ask you the same question, first of all, I asked the previous panel, uh, and that is if you actually have evidence of backlining, backfilling of uh, support staff positions by uh, frontline officers. Um, um, Mr Penman said he hadn't detected much of that, and in his, uh, his well, announced inspection in Fife hadn't detected much, uh, although Tina Yu said there was some evidence of what they call cover in the custody cases. I just wondered what your view on that might be. 
very different from Mr Penman's, I'm afraid. Um, I'll give you an example, and that's the C3 strategic document. Uh, the C3 strategic document announced in January. Um, and we don't call it backfilling the C3 strategic document. We call it rebalancing the workforce mm. in a place of condition that wasn't balanced in the first place. Now, what that proposes for C3 is that the split of the workforce would be 55% mem 55 members of staff, 45% police officers. Uh, I'm not aware of any police control rooms in uh, Scotland, apart from the one which was entirely police officers, but the rest were well under 30% 30, 30 police officers to 70% uh, police staff. Uh, so that's a rebalancing, which suggests to me that the police, officer, uh, police staff numbers will decrease and police officer numbers will increase. You may say, well, there's experience in police officers going into control rooms, but Dumfries, for example, was 100 per cent police staff. I didn't see any degradation of service there, and in fact, I believe they were commended for the service that they gave the members of the public down there. So I feel that's a false argument. However, uh, the, uh, Mr Penn was also talking about um, uh, how the scope system, the HR system, would be able to identify if their police officers were backfilling on a permanent basis. Uh, part of the budget document the Police of Scotland put forward was that um, efforts have been made to reduce the deficit by, the, the, uh, uh, by not uh, employing people when a vacancy arised. However, that work is still there to be done, and I, I can sure you can imagine who is going to be doing that work. It will be a police officer that is put in there, not, not necessarily registered in that particular role, but if there is work to be done, uh, and uh, then there has got to be someone there to do it, and that generally be a police officer. I like Stevie. My, my uh, members uh, don't bring that issue to me as, as regularly uh, as I'm sure his do. But again, I, I'd really re-emphasise my earlier evidence that, that if you're going to cut a budget and 91% of your budget mm -hmm. is staffing, then you are going to have to release some of that staff. It's been traditional in the police service across the UK that they stop recruiting and police officer numbers drop, and, and that hasn't happened here eh, for a variety of reasons. Therefore, a eh, voluntary redundancy was used, uh, and, and, and we have regrettably seen a cutback in a number of, of support staff that we have, and the job still has to be done. So I, I think logic would dictate that there will be more police officers performing these functions. Eh, we would like to see that rebalanced. Mm -hmm. And clearly that has a resource implication, because police officer uh, salaries are higher than the sports staff staff. To, to a certain extent, I think I think you'll find that uh, it depends what role you're performing uh, and who's performing it. But but the starting salary for a police officer in real terms is, is considerably lower than it was some time ago. So, so I, I, I you know it's 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 it about where you sit in, in that side of the argument. What is the starting salary? Well, I think a, a starting police officer will be around about twenty thousand. It, it then continues uh, as they go through their probationary period and out the other side. But but uh, in real terms, compared to what it was. Uh, given inflation and such like, it's a lot lower than it was previously. And what's the starting salary? Maybe it's too broad a question for support staff. Roughly about 15,000. 15, and uh, to put it into perspective, around about 60% of police staff earn under £21,000. Thank you. Uh, on the issue of the control rooms, and we touched on this in the previous panel as well, there was uh, concern that because um, in the, the new control rooms might not have the local knowledge that the previous control rooms, such as uh, Dumfries had, and therefore there would have to be a transfer of information to local police officers in order to get the uh, to identify where incidents were taking place. Have you any evidence that that's been happening, or that there's have there been issues raised with you about the efficiency of the way in which that's happening? And in terms of again, it has a resource implication if it is putting additional burdens on police officers in order to be able to resolve some of the, the issues around that. To be honest, nothing specific about about uh, location. However, that, uh, what I have to remember is that the members, that, uh, sorry, the people that have taken the work from Dumfries are our members as well. Um, they're put under a burden as well because they have to they have to try to work out where the location is. And I'm not going to say there's not going to be difficulties. That will happen anywhere across Scotland. Um, there are technological uh, assistance to be able to to give that. But you know, if someone's unaware of where they are, they say they come across a, a road crash on a remote road, and they're not aware of the location. It's very, very difficult in any case uh, for, for someone to do that. Possibly easier for someone with local knowledge who may be able to say a, a local landmark or something like that, which would step it out, uh, as opposed to someone who uh, just doesn't really know that, no, that, that knowledge and isn't able to zoom in the electronic map or the location or whatever. So th yes, there will, be, there will be issues around that, but the staff who are in place to deal with that have had training that would assist them to be able to assist, you know, be able to find out where those locations are. Okay. And in terms of the IT systems which uh, support this sort of activity, 
Uh, again, previous panels seem to be reasonably content with progress on those. Is that your understanding that the IT systems are developing quickly enough and are appropriate, or would you believe that more resources are required well, to make them more effective? Could, just, can I just say an answer to, to, to the control room question? That, you know, we, we, we went from eight forces into one, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think it should come to any great surprise that we tried to amalgamate uh, some of the services that were duplicates. That was the, one of the reasons for reform, uh, and I am not aware of any uh, instances where wrong locations have been given, and, and, and this has been happening across Scotland over a number of years. Control rooms have been closed clo and, and becoming larger. So I, I think that issue is actually n not a, a, a relevant issue. It hasn't, it hasn't become so. In relation to IT, I, I would just re emphasise what, what Mr Penman said. Our association was greatly critical of the way ACPOS uh, organised its IT. I don't think we'd ever get to the stage of having national IT systems without a national force, and it was one of the reasons why we supported the creation of a national force. Uh, a lot of the savings of reform uh, are based on I6 being a success. Mm -hmm. and, and from what I've seen, and I, I regularly go to programme board meetings, it is being a very well managed and, and a great deal of scrutiny from all levels has been placed on it to make sure we don't have the same problems mm -hmm. uh, that we've had with previous public sector IT uh, projects. So from, from the knowledge I have just now, I would have to say I have some confidence that it, that it is going to deliver. John Pentland, followed by Sandra, followed by Roderick, followed by John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Mr Diamond, uh, the Police Federation have suggested that local authorities should take up the support roles of what's obviously uh, at this time more than supported by yourself. Do you think that's uh, the way forward or would you object totally to that? I think that's taking us back to the, the 70s, whenever members of police staff were actually ever employed by local authorities. I think we've moved on since then. I think policing has moved on. And I think that the uh, members of police staff are much more integrated, or should be much more integrated into the policing team, rather than being separated out. That's not to say that we shouldn't be looking at partnership working in the future, and maybe some areas where that is there. But we should be equal partners rather than uh, having funding directly, you know, directly run by local authorities. I think, as I pointed out earlier on, everyone's under budgetary constraints. Um, we should be looking at things very, very carefully. But the policing is a much more specialised beast uh, than it was in the, the 70s and 80s. And considering over the past two or three years, you've seen. Uh you know, staff reduced by nearly 1,500 to 2,000, and we're now moving into a, you know, a further efficiency drive. Uh, what's the likely impact of that to, to you and your members? In Unison's views, I think it's going to be catastrophic. Um, 2015, 2016, we haven't identified where the savings are going to come from, but when 10% is your running costs of your organisation, 90% is the, the, the staffing levels, but of that 90%, 15% is police staff and the rest are police officers, and that, that figure's uh, ring-fenced. It doesn't take a genius to work out where the, the savings are going to be coming from, and it's going to be our members that are going to be suffering. Okay. Thank you, John. Sandra... Did you want to oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I must put my glasses on. Oh, it's Alison. Yes, yeah. Alison. Could I, just, just, you say it would be your members that would suffer from that, but surely it would be the people of Scotland and the service provided to, to the people of Scotland that will suffer if, as, as uh, Chief Superintendent Niven uh, Rennie said earlier, that the police officers themselves are not equipped to do these jobs and um, not trained to do these jobs. I've got to agree with you there. Um, uh, when we've got a limited budget, then you have a duty of best value. Uh, and I'm afraid that I don't believe we've got a duty, but we're, we're achieving best value because we have ring fence one major part of the of the workforce. And that's not to say that we should be paying off police officers, but we need to have a look at how we work that workforce. We went from nine organisations down to one organisation. We reduced nine sets of senior management down to one. However, we maintained those numbers. Where if this was a, 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 a business, when you reduce nine down to one, you would reduce eight lots of senior management teams and take those numbers down, and that didn't happen. There was a, a, a deal there of sorts, but the money has been put elsewhere into that organisation to maintain those numbers and a, a much more expensive uh, uh, resource than it would have been if uh, we were losing police staff in, the, in that respect. Okay. John, will you want to come in on that? You said... You said you Mr Diamond, um, I think that's perhaps the, the, the case at local level, but uh, I certainly welcome the considerable reduction in the number of chief officer ranks. Um, I thought service was much the richer for that. Uh, it was the case that there was quite a, a, a removal of ranks at chief officer level. 
Yes, but I, I, what I meant by that was that perhaps the 17234 should have reduced by the commensurate number of that, that, uh, rather than maintaining 17234. Uh, again, I think everyone welcomes a, a, a high number of police officers, but whenever you have a budget to meet, then you have to use your resources most appropriately. And is it appropriate to maintain one highly paid set of individuals as opposed to a better value, more focused set of individuals? I think that's the, the second option is a better one to take. I just add uh, our members also saw a decrease. Uh, at what we have seen possibly is a, a larger SPA than we expected, uh, and, and perhaps a, a larger perk than we expected. And, and, and although it's right and proper that we should have be, be scrutinised, I think we should also examine what element of the savings by reform uh, has gone to, to creating other organisations as well. But it certainly was the case that these chief officers' staff association cost £5 million to run. That's £5 million that could and should, and it's now properly being deployed on operational policing. Indeed. But I think, again, it's, it's a wider issue. I think if we are to, to, uh, to truly make savings, then we need transformational change. It just shouldn't be short term as to reach a budget. We should be looking at how we operate. Uh, as a service, uh, what, as Stephen said earlier, what, what services we perform and who performs them, making long-term savings, and I think that work is still to be done to a certain extent. Okay, I'm going to move to Sandra, Roderick, and John Finney back um, again. Something else is it a different one, John. Well, there was one related to that. No, then. not to that. No, I'm just find you a wee bite there. I'll come back. Sandra, <laughs> Roderick, then I've got you there after that. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much, convener. I must admit I concur with the comments that John uh, had made. Could you tell me what is PERC? PERC is the, the, the Police Information and Review Commission. It's, it's people who investigate the police when there's a complaint. Right, so to... Yep. So two of the issues that you raised, uh, Chief Superintendent, I hope that's correct, I'm not yep. too sure, uh, uh, Rene, is that uh, the SPA are, are too big. Well, I, I wouldn't Authority say... I wouldn't... And the PERK PERC investigation uh, it, PERC. PERC. It's, it's not a case that I'm saying they're too big. I, I, what I'm saying is that some of the money that we, we, we allocated from a, re reducing the eight forces into one, we, we identified savings... Some, there's a perception that some of these savings uh, have gone into directorships uh, within the SPA, for example, uh, and, and we just think that it's not just the service that needs to be looked at, it's perhaps the wider area uh, of, of the bodies that have grown since reform as well. Uh, thank you. I'm sure we will ask these questions of uh, the, the two gentlemen that will come up here before, be, before the, the committee anyway. I wanted to ask you, similar to what I'd asked the previous panel, uh, basically, obviously, the Audit Scotland report and about working together and the examples I gave about money being taken from police budget via health care, uh, put forward to health care, I think we all supported that here in this committee, uh, being given to the NHS rather than being delivered separately. I, I just wondered, and I, I was going to say, I think I could preempt what you're going to say, you know, you haven't been involved with some of the comments that yourself and Mr Diamond has made already. Were yourselves involved in any of those discussions whatsoever in regards to, you know, consultation and strategies to achieving budgetary savings? Not in relation to that uh, recently, but, but uh, some time ago our association uh, started some of that dialogue to say why are the police service uh, providing health care, uh, and it came from a 1957 circular. Mm -hmm. So it had been happening for years, and it was an appropriate discussion, the right decision has been taken, uh, and as was discussed earlier, some of the budget has gone across to health to do that, uh, and that is a proper uh, way for it to be managed. Mm -hmm. I was going to say 1957 is a wee bit before my time, <laughs> <laughs> but never mind. I just wanted to know if, if the, yourselves have been involved in any of the talks that's uh, going on uh, between, about the strategies. Obviously, the health is one, and we've got the forensic science is the other, and obviously there's one that I'm sure you'll agree in is the increase in, in, in pensions, police pensions. And well, that's got to be something that's been well, welcomed uh, by yourselves. Breaking these down, uh, some of it we wouldn't, it's not appropriate for us to be involved in. It's, it's a, a decision for the force and, and for the SPA, although our members may be involved in some of that discussion. So, so we will be informed of the strategy and we'll be kept updated about developments and, and that's right and proper. But actually contributing to discussion mm. is not something we would do as an association per se. In relation to pensions, that's one of our fund fundamental reasons 
uh, for existence is to look after the terms and conditions and welfare of our members. And, and uh, pensions, as you'll be aware, is largely discussed at a UK level. It's, it's, it's not been devolved. And uh, we are kept updated and, and contribute to that, but we're represented by one of my colleagues in England and Wales in relation to pension dialogue. Yeah, I'm just going to say, you know, obviously it has increased uh, by 4.4% and it's been awarded. Uh, you mentioned about down in England there was an, an awful lot of uh, disruption there, put it that way, but it hasn't been accepted in that respect by the Westminster government. So I, I'm not wanting to come, you know, an argument here at all. I'm just pointing out that there has been money in the police budget put forward in, from the Scottish Government to police pensions, and I would assume that would be what? welcome. But I wanted to ask Mr Diamond... Do you have any dialogue with the, the previous panellists or Police Scotland or the SPA in regards to what's happening about the budget? Yeah, we generally, we're, we're told. I mean, and again, it's, it's, yeah, it's, similar, yeah. it's similar to uh, uh, Niven's answer and that it's not appropriate for us to be involved in that. In that or, you know, it's the organisation's decision to make. However, mm. if we see that there's an issue with that, organisa that organisational decision, then that's whenever we become involved in it. I must say that things have, have moved on uh, and we're involved much earlier in the conversations now, so it's not as much of a fait accompli, but we, we, we still think there's, there's room for improvement in that. But it's not our... It's not a decision for us to make. Otherwise, we would have made that right decision. <laughs> so, I just follow, sorry, Chair, just, just to get a bit of clarification, perhaps, even for, my, for myself. I'm glad that you're you know, engaging it slightly earlier. So what action can yourselves take if you're unhappy of what comes forward from Police Scotland in regards to, obviously, the issues that you've raised here today? Is there any action that you can take in regards to feedback yeah, absolutely. We will feed back to Police Scotland through our, our consultative process. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, this week there was a demonstration as well of, of uh, how we feed back through the Scottish Police Authority when we submitted a paper uh, regarding about the, the, the C3 proposals. So we have the, the ability to be able to do that and we'll come to elected members as well yeah. to, to, <laughs> to raise our, 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 our issues uh, with you. Um, uh, that's the sort of process that we'd have to go through. Okay. Thank you. Could I just ask yourself, Chair, or, or the committee? You mentioned well, I'm not you, giving evidence. No, no, no. <laughs> I just wanted to I request be that uh, yes. you mentioned the fact that you've given this paper about the C3 yeah. uh, to the police authority. We're obviously going to get evidence from there. Could we ask them to supply that? Paper? Sorry, what are you asking, sir? What uh, Mr Diamond and the trade unions have pr produced for SPA in regards to the budget and their thoughts on the changes. It was presented to that the SPA. I just wondered if we can ask for that paper for us to get it. Yeah, I'm just wondering if it is a public paper. Is it a public paper? No, it was, uh, it was presented in private, I believe. And uh, it, would it, be, it, would be, it would be for the SPA to decide if they were worth willing to disclose that. Yes, we can ask. We can I ask. think it was a bilateral thing if you've been discussing. We perhaps want both parties to agree to it. If it was a negotiating paper, yeah. I understand that. OK, that, that's fine. You've Cheers. got it on the ring. <coughs> right. <coughs> Excuse me. Come in, it's a supplementary. I was going to come in at a later date, but could I then ask you, Mr Diamond, that if your consultation paper that you sent to the SPA, did it have any influence on the decision that was taken? Uh, it, it, uh, it informed a meeting. Further to that, I think it's the easiest way... <laughs> Wonderfully diplomatic. Thank you. <laughs> As I yes. have been, because John just leapt in without, you know, but I've been so diplomatic, I, I must keep taking my pills. Um, so we'll, we, if we can get the paper, we will get it. I understand there's a certain discretion here from also yourself, if I'm reading between the lines. <laughs> yes. Um, Roderick, followed by John Finney. John, you're still in, are you wanting? No, take me out. Take you out now. Oh, well, that's good. I'll delete you. <laughs> Delete. No, don't do that. Roger, <laughs> Roger followed by John Perry, followed by Alison. Uh, morning, gentlemen. Um, Association of Scottish Police Superintendents survey found that long hours are a matter of routine and a growing problem that impacts the quality of life, resilience and the health of senior officers. Um, we also know from the Scottish um, Police Authority Finance Report that the police staff salary budget was... Uh, overspent by 0.152 million, which 0.1485 seems to be the cost of SBA corporate staff. And we also know that there has been an overspend 
in overtime for police officer costs. And what I'm trying to do is reconcile those uh, kind of bits of evidence. Well, I, th I think if I, I may start then, that, that superintendents don't get paid overtime, so that's maybe reconciling some of that. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, I, I would really say, all joking aside, uh, real significant concerns about the workload of my members. Uh, we have reduced the numbers of superintendents considerably uh, through reform without really measuring what has been left for the remainder to carry. Uh, and our survey to which you referred earlier has shown that uh, for a vast majority of our members, long hours uh, is the norm. Uh, on call, when they're not actually working, with calls throughout the night and expected to be at their desk at 7 o'clock the following morning. A uh, lot of travel to go to meetings. Uh, and, and over and above that, they're also reporting that they can't take their rest days and they can't take their annual leave. And more worryingly, that when they feel sick, they would rather use annual leave than report sick. Uh, that is a culture that we have highlighted to the force, uh, and I've written again to the director of HR this, in the last week to say we need to do something about this uh, because my members are carrying an intolerable burden. Okay. Mr. Diamond, did you want to comment on those things as far as they impacted? Could you? Yeah. I don't know if it's your Sorry. microphone. Probably if you're leaning a bit, away. it's a bit Mr. quiet. Mr. Diamond, is did it? you want to comment? Yes. On that? To be honest, it's a, a similar situation as well. Um, whenever staff are feeling under pressure, they'll do anything that they can to, uh, to um, make, make it known that they are, they are the right person for the job, if you like. And uh, uh, albeit we do have, uh, we, most of our staff do qualify for overtime, a lot of it will be paid in time rather than actual uh, in a monetary payment. So, um, uh, but yeah, there are, there are real pressures on staff to perform, to fill in the gaps that, are, that have been left by either people leaving or, or roles that haven't been uh, filled. Um, and that, that's, uh, I'm surprised, to be perfectly honest, uh, that the, uh, the sickness absence rate hasn't increased considerably more. That's been the experience previously that it, that, that, that would happen. People just burn themselves out. I think that may be in the, the upcoming, in the very near future. Um, Mr. Nevin, uh, Mr. Rennie, uh, Chief Superintendent Rennie, um, we'll get it right eventually. Um, we'll so I'm well used to it. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you feel that uh, Police Scotland and SPA are res receptive to the comments that your organisation is making? At a certain level, they are. Uh, we certainly had acknowledgement from the Chief Constable and, and at various meetings from the Director of HR that there is a problem and that our survey has shown that. What has been slightly worrying for us is we're now six months since that survey was produced and there hasn't even been a meeting yet to discuss how we're going to tackle it. Uh, so so the, the, the demand goes on, my members continue to be stretched and, and we don't see any tangi uh, tangible uh, action being taken uh, to address this. Thank you. Um, I've got Alison. Yeah, Lisa, can you supplement? Well, can I take Alison first? Yes, She's not absolutely. Been in yet. I'll absolutely. take Alison and then I'll let you in with a supplementary. Alison. Thank you. I, I mean, I'm concerned by um, the starkness of what you've just said. I mean, you said your staff are facing an intolerable <laughs> burden. And, and Mr. Diamond has also expressed concern about, about the pressures that are there. Um, all of this um, flows from the, the, the savings um, that are expected, which um, flow from an outline business case, which in itself was sketchy at best, which everyone, whether they supported the reforms or not, I think, raised concern about some time ago. Would you support calls for a review of the timetable? for the delivery of these savings through I reform? I think three years in, there's maybe a need to revisit what was in that business case. I think, yeah. I think the word you used was sketchy, and I think there'd be, a, there'd be a recognition of that, but some of it was also predicated on staff reductions at police officer level, which yeah. hasn't happened, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's a fact. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I, I go back to what I said earlier, we need to review exactly how we operate and what we're trying to, trying to deliver. Uh, the public and the politicians have to have a, a lesser expectation of us if you're going to cut our budget, uh, and, and therefore we can't be everything to everyone. And just now we are trying to be, I think, and a lot of that burden has been, has been taken by my members. And if we don't face up to that review, um, what do you think the risks are to the service? Well, I think we, we, we're a can-do organisation. Uh, we will continue to try and deliver the level of service that's expected of us. I think the risks are that will be mistakes. And unfortunately, as we've seen across the United Kingdom, when mistakes happen in public service, there's an inquiry to find out why it happened and whose fault it was. 
And I think there's, there's more than just the service at blame here. We need to make a, have a fundamental review of what we require from the police. ask you, are you aware of any budget or um, for a whistleblower type um, helpline that would help those people who are off sex where um, there is burnout, where people are feeling the job is getting them down or specific issues that they can then raise in confidence and be taken seriously? Is, are you aware of any budget that exists for that just now? There is a facility uh, for that. But I, I would say I've, I've been in the Superintendents Association for 11 years, and, and my members are professional uh, career police officers who, who want to uh, do a good job and, and always uh, will be committed to their job first and foremost. And I think there's a sometimes an onus on them to admit when it gets too much, but I think there's a feeling amongst them that that be showing some sort of weakness and therefore they don't do that. So whilst they may have a provision, whether it be utilised or not, I'm not so confident. Yeah. Are you confident that they are even aware that it's there? Oh yes, they're, they're aware it's there. Certainly, at my my level, my, my, my members we would help to publicise that to make sure their staff are well taken care of. So they're, they're well aware there is there are facilities. Mm -hmm. And confidence in terms of how it's dealt with and working, operating at present. I've, I've no evidence to suggest there's, there's no confidence in it. I think everybody's confident that when we utilise the, the facility works. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dunn, any comments on that? Because yeah. it would apply to staff too. Absolutely. Like uh, Chief Superintendent Rennie said, there, his members would inform my members of, of the, the facility and it is, it is well used. We generally receive a report, I think it's either a quarterly report or a, or a monthly report, uh, which gives a breakdown of the issues that have been raised in the confidential helpline. But similarly, we will receive calls from members. Um, one of the issues that we have about, uh, for example, stress, we carried out a stress survey, which pretty much echoed what the Superintendent's uh, uh, Association uh, gained from their survey. Um, when we carried that survey out, it was quite clear that there were members who were really suffering from stress, but the only way at the moment that the organisation records that is if they go off sick with stress. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a likelihood that people will not, so it, it appears to be under-reporting because there's no real method of actually accounting for what uh, people who are suffering from stress but don't want to actually go off their work because they're, head, they're afraid of putting their head above the parapet, if you like. Uh, and is this information, obviously it's anonymous, it's just a general issue. Can this be made available? Um, is it something that the committee could look at? Again, that, that, that's, that's uh, for the SPA to decide. Right. It's their information. It might be worth seeing that because it gives to, to give an indication of where the pressure points are. Possibly, yeah. yeah. You're next anyway, John, so no need to look anxious. <laughs> Anxious. No, I'm, I'm actually looking a bit frustrated. Um, and, and if the gentleman will forgive me for being so direct, it's time for you to put up or shut up. You're prepared to come in the glare of publicity and make these allegations, which I absolutely understand to be the case. Has there been a, a stress assessment done of individual posts? Have grievances been reached? There's nothing I'm aware that suggests that either of your groups of members are not covered by the working time regulations. There should be an agreement in place. It used to be. I don't suppose it's changed. Uh, 47 hours averaged over a 17-week rotational cycle. There should be issues of compensated arrest. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, will make Mr House pay attention than litigation. So, I mean, can I commend the route, can I commend the route of tendering a grievance, going through due process, because I can assure you you would uh, get a lot of support if that were the case, and it will focus minds on what the important issues are, which is about workload. Yes, uh, and the effect of individuals, <clears throat> and in turn the effect on the public. I fully appreciate what you're saying. Uh, you have to remember that, that whilst we have an executive, we also go with the wills of our, of our membership. And, and some find, you know, being professional police officers, taking on the force in such a way is unpalatable. We, we are continuing just now to try to negotiate with the force as a first instance. But I can agree that some of my members who are slightly verging on the more militant are suggesting the route that, that you're, you're suggesting but there. But Mr Rennie, the, the, the difficulty is it's not militant. What does it say to the public if you say, my members are going to enforce legislation that, as regards you, but protective legislation, vital health and safety legislation that applies to your members, well, we are going to set that aside because we are career police officers. That sends a very, very poor signal, and I would encourage engagement through a formal process that, that could be done. And I, I, I hope... I hope uh, the Chief Constable is listening to this. Well, we have an executive meeting on Thursday, Mr Finney, and I'll certainly put your comments on uh, the agenda. And see well, yes, questions, but I, mean, I think he's <laughs> well, leading well, a campaign. <laughs> no. well, well, can I move on to, to a couple of well, questions? Well, uh, wait a minute, check where you are. 
Yes, you are. It's you next. Sorry, sorry. Well, that's, that, that's, that, that, that's reassuring. Thank you, convener. Um, sorry, uh, yes, sorry, Mr. Dan. Uh, you, you heard the comment I directed to the, uh, the, the inspector about my understanding of a changed arrangement for road policing unit and the issues that have been raised over a number of periods indeed have been raised today about devolved resource management. And it seems the unfortunate reality is that your members have little control over budgetary matters. I, I would go further. Uh, 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 throughout my service, I've seen budgets get devolved and brought back in. Uh, I think the problem we have just now is... I don't think my members have the, the staffing support locally to be able to manage their budgets. Uh, the, 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 that is one area of the business uh, divisional administration support which has, has gone through voluntary redundancy largely. Uh, so, so whilst I would welcome devolved budgets and, and the greater powers to, to, to uh, move the budgets around locally, I just don't think we have the infrastructure to support that at present. And would you agree that, that that would be an opportunity to say to folk that regardless of the fact it's a single service, that that service does reflect local priorities because local decisions are being made by local commanders who have autonomy in financial matters? I think all my uh, members would like to have more power to, to, to tackle matters locally and, and having a budget would certainly help them. So specifically on the issue uh, and a suggestion that road policing would only be available on a 24-hour basis from that specialist unit at three locations so that north of Perth there's nothing. Would that concern you? I, I have heard that for the first time this morning from yourself, Mr Finney, so I'd need to find out more information about well, if how If it were that, accurate, would it concern you? If there was to be no road policing, but I, I, having former, been a former head of road policing, yeah. I, I wouldn't see that it would be totally withdrawn in that way, so there, there, there must be some sort of contingency, and i need to find out more. OK, thank you very much. A question for Mr Diamond. Mr Diamond, we've got a lot of statistics about the National Voluntary Release Panel uh -huh. and, and a lot of statistics around that. There's one aspect I wanted to ask you about, and I know you're, you're, you're very involved with your members here, and it's just the sentence that says, the return on investment profile is currently 1.06 years based on full year savings of £23.459 million. And I'm assuming that that says after one6 <laughs> Zero six years, the saving is realised. Yes. Is there not an ongoing financial implication for any pension issues around your members who have taken that scheme? So, or is that factored into that 1.06 years? I believe that it's factored in, and I believe it's based on the Scottish Government guidelines, which are based again on, on national guidelines. Um, so, I, I believe that's been taken into account, but I had to check on that to be absolutely certain. Okay, thank you. I'd be grateful if you could. That that, that, that would be helpful. Um, also around the issue of um, pending decisions, are you content with the way that, that that's being dealt with? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we, we're involved in the panel but as observers and we don't make any decisions about who is released or not, but we're there to make sure that the process is carried out fairly. Okay, doke. thank you very yeah. much. Uh, sorry, you. if it's okay, can I, yes. I, I yes, reply to you about the, the grievance part of it? Okay. Is that we're a, a lay-led lay -led, uh, union. Our members are the ones that drive that. It takes a real, real guts for a low-paid member of staff who think their job is under, under threat to come to us to say, I want to raise a grievance. So our, mem our members will be the ones who will say to us that they want to raise that grievance. We will encourage them to do that and give them that support through that. But it takes real, real strength of character for them it, to be able to do that. It does, of course, and it's also a further aggravation for anyone to victimise someone who la 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 lays, oh, ab raises absolutely. a legitimate grievance. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, when it comes to uh, uh, put up or shut up, believe me, we put up all the time when it comes to these issues. And we have to go through the real process, the, the, the legitimate process that we have. Um, and if it does come to going to a legislature, uh, going through courts, we will do that, but we have to have that back up from our members in the first place. Please believe me, I was actually trying to be supportive. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> Thank I don't think Mr Diamond's a shrinking violet anyway in anything, <laughs> no, no. neither is Chief Superintendent Rennie, Two pretty tough men <laughs> representing their uh, members. Uh, I move on to Christian Allard, followed by John Pentland. regarding how we can uh, maybe make some saving and maybe you'll put it differently that we're putting now. And one of his examples was quite telling was, you know, Aberdeen Football Club and some, some of the games now, there is no police presence. So maybe we need to redefine all those things and maybe now that we've got the clarity of, of uh, uh, we, we've got that, that, uh, that change to a single force, it's maybe time to, to redefine what police should do and what police shouldn't do. And how much do you think all these events have been football club or uh, uh, football events, for example, will attract, I believe, a lot of uh, 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 hours during the weekend. 
and a lot of disturbance in the in, in, in policing uh, at, at divisional level. How much of that uh, do you think would make a difference? And can we maybe? Do you think that uh, some of these uh, uh, costs have been recovered significantly or not? I think there's two aspects to that. The first one's the football one, yeah, and I thought Mr Penman's answer was excellent. And over a period of time, we have gradually uh, withdrawn uh, policing from football uh, to a certain extent. But you still get the big game recently in the, the press as Celtic and Rangers are going to play again. And there is a cost recovery from uh, the, the game, uh, from the, the clubs. But you have to remember it's wider than that. Just because the game takes place in Glasgow doesn't mean to say there's not a policing consequence in Aberdeen or, or Edinburgh. And that it's not really a, there's no ability to, to cover that, uh, get that back from the clubs, because you can't say directly what, what was uh, caused by the football. In the wider sense, though, in terms of cost recovery, I've been very impressed about how Police Scotland have operated. Uh, so much so they have been criticised. Uh, the Wickham Man Festival in Dumfries, for example, mm -hmm. there was criticism about uh, the way the Police Scotland went about their cost recovery. But in days of tight budgets, then if the police are required, then it's quite right if it's a commercial entity that they should refund the cost of the policing. And, and I think they're, they're well down the road of doing that. So you're quite happy to the direction we are taking. Yes. And that direction should be uh, affecting everything that, that, that you do, uh, what will be public event or private event, uh, uh, inside, indoors or, or outdoors. Those things should be judged in a matter. Maybe we should raise the money before the event happens. I, I think... As I said earlier, I think we need to look at everything the police do. What, what is appropriate for the police to do? What is appropriate for other agencies to do? What is it we expect of the police? And what funding, uh, where, where does the funding come from? I think that is part of transformational change, and I think that work requires to be undertaken. On transformational change, uh, we talked in the first panel, and you, you, I think you edited two verses in, in some of the answers you gave, regarding uh, partnership. What, do you see partnership not only with local authorities, but as well with third sector and maybe private sector as well, especially in the prevention? Uh, prevention I, think, I think everything should be up for discussion. At our conference last year, we had the third, part, uh, third sector uh, had an input, uh, saying what they could do to support the police. Uh, we, we would welcome uh, all avenues uh, of exploring how the police operate in the future. Uh, so you would welcome... Uh, uh, a budget partnership, and as well, maybe sometime not to be the leading uh, uh, authority on, 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 the, on, the, on, on this campaign or on this action. I think we should be open-minded, uh, and, and we, let's, let's recognise we've come a long way in partnership. Partnership working is not something new. Uh, we've been working in partnership with local authorities, with other partners for a number of years, I think. But I think as we go forward, we need to be open-minded and look at all sectors of society and see what they can deliver in the criminal justice arena. Thank you. John Pedland. You've been uh, two small questions. The uh, first one, you mentioned absenteeism and sickness uh, earlier on. Can you give us a percentage terms what that actually is per year? And how does that compare with last year and the year before? And the second question is, following on from the put up or shut up comment, uh, do you think it's right that the Chief Constable controls most of the resources but does not report to an accountable officer? Um, for the absence figures, I don't have them off the top of my head. Uh, they, they were reported at the last SPA meeting. Uh, as part of the, the, I think it's roughly about 10%. Yes. Um, however, the, the, what the, the report did say was that there was a, a, an upturn, uh, albeit perhaps not as much as we expected just now. Um, as for the Chief, uh, Chief Constable reporting to an, uh, an accountable officer, I believe that's done through the SPA. He has to report to the SPA to ensure that his budget is, is balanced, and, uh, and that's the way it's, uh, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been carried out. It's not really for me to be able to say whether that's right or wrong. With our, our association, it tends to be presenteeism rather than absenteeism that causes the issue. Uh, so so uh, I would like to make sure my members are taking appropriate time off. Uh, that is one of, one of my main concerns. With regard to the Chief Constable, I think it's right and proper. The, stat the statutory obligation lies with the Chief Constable. He does report to the SPA. And as you found out earlier, he's inspected by other bodies as well. Uh, I, I, I think that is the correct structure. We, that. we didn't find it out. We knew it. <laughs> We do know about Audit Scotland and the <laughs> yes, inspectorate. Sir. Just thought I'd save your Quite correct. there from... Okay. Thank you. Right, thank you very much for your evidence. That concludes this evidence session. Thank you.
I'm going to, if you like, committee, I'll just move straight on. Do you want me to move straight on? No break. OK. I'm now moving straight on to item seven, public petitions committee. We better do it on the record. Uh, just, can we just get moving on, please pay attention, team. Item seven, public petitions. You want to say something, Roger? Uh, thank you, convener. Could I just record for the record um, my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Right, now we move on to the first petition, a new petition, PE 1501, public inquiries into self-inflicted accidental deaths following suspicious death investigations. The Scottish Government has committed, as we have been told, to bringing forward legislation to implement the recommendation of Lord Cullen's review of fatal accident inquiry legislation. Scrutiny of FAI legislation may be the most appropriate forum for the issues raised by the petitioners to be considered. Can I have your comments, please? Sandra. Fatal accident inquiry one? Yes. I, I, I... On PE 1501, oh, yes. The one, the, the, that the, particular yeah. petition, just now, the new one. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, I was PE 1280. I was We've not come one. to that yet. Right, OK, I'll leave that one just now then. What? It's OK. Do you want me to push it on? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, uh, yes, yes. Just bear with me a minute. I'm having prompting all round. Are you content to consider this position as part of our scrutiny of the forthcoming legislation on FAIs? That's what I was trying to get at you. Yes. Yes. You are. Do you, do you wish to write to the Crown Office and PF Service to ascertain the level of investigation carried out into the 4,000 deaths classed as self-inflicted for the last five years? I think that would be a statistic we would like to have. What, what am I getting back from you, yeses? Yes. The ongoing petitions, PE 1280, fatal accident inquiries and deaths abroad, like the previous petition, this petition also is obviously relates to FAIs. Again, are members content to note the developments outlined in the papers and agree to return to the petition once the legislation on FAIs has been introduced? This you know, yes. Ready, yes, this is me now, 1280. Right. I, would, I would like to keep uh, the petition opened, uh, and I know that the, the, the government has been looking at this, and I think it's September that we're going to come forward uh, with, with some proposals. But I would September like, uh, oh no, next sorry, year? Bill, yes, 2015. I, I would like to write to the, of the committee, uh, request the committee write to the CAB SEC, and ask for an update on this particular one. Uh, there's a number of MSPs have raised this uh, through constituents as well, and it's been ongoing for quite a while. And I welcome, you know, obviously, the, the, the looking at legislation, but I would like a wee update. I'm just considering if it's not being... Um, I don't quite know whether it's proposals or something's mm -hmm. going to be lodged um, as a bill. If it's September 2015, is there sufficient time to do that legislation within the session. We, we could ask that in the, in the I think that's the really something we'd... Then, sorry, perhaps. Elaine, yes? Just, the note from the clerk just says 2015, not September yes. 2015. I wondered if we could maybe get a, a, a timeline from the Scottish Government in terms of when it intends yes, to bring us forward. Yes, I would go along would with that. Would it be... Is it also possible to ask what they're thinking is what it will cover? Because mm -hmm. some of these petitions are on different things. I mean, is it a broad thing in FEIs yeah. or just FEIs? in deaths abroad or what? You know, what is the intention for this bill to cover? Yes, Do we want so. to also ask, apart from being told broadly 2015, obviously the clerks have done their best to find out, yeah. is whether there will be sufficient time for this to be processed during the course of this session. Mm -hmm. Is that happy with something along those lines? Mm -hmm. Alison, you're not looking no, as if you're... No, no, you are, no, you're no, just no, thinking. No, thank you. You've got your thinking face on, right. <laughs> oh. That's what we'll do. Thank you. PE1370, no independent inquiry of the McGrahy conviction. You've got the most recent submission at uh, uh, Annex A of Paper 6. It makes clear that the JFM and Police Scotland have had two constructive meetings since we last considered the petition. And in a separate development, the Lockerbie relatives now have made a submission to the SCCRC. Now, could have uh, members content to note the progress being made on this petition uh, between JFM and Police Scotland and maintain a watching brief and also perhaps a watching brief what happens to the SCCRC? To keep it open. I think that would be good. And can I just say, each time I have to say that we have members of JFM who come to the public area and make a long journey to, to be here and that, you know, we welcome their 
attention to what the committee is doing in this regard. And I know they've kept going for a very long time. Particularly, I'm going to mention Robert Forrester, because I know he's made a long journey to come to every one of our meetings, Mr Forrester. You mustn't clap. You mustn't clap. <laughs> But I do, I do uh, thank you for your attention. So we're keeping it open while we monitor these two things. PE 1427 multi-party actions. The Scottish Government has stated that in the long term it's committed to multi-party or class actions. It will consult in its approach to matters that will be taken forward by primary legislation following share of Principal Taylor's recommendations. Are you content to keep the petition open until after the Scottish Government has developed its approach to this issue? Thank you very much, yes. Do members also wish to ask the Scottish Government to specifically include the petitioner in its consultation and to respond to the petitioner's concerns about the withholding of documents by private companies? Roddy, yes. The Information Act, but there are obviously court processes for the disclosure of documents which are out with the Freedom of Information, so it's partial. I don't have a problem if uh, the committee wants to write to the government about it, but just thought that it was well to point I out. I think we appreciate the limitations of the Freedom yeah. of Information yeah. Act, but within, within its remit is to provide as much as possible. But I think in courtesy, at the very least, to the petitioner yeah. is to specifically invite him to respond. You agree? Okay. Yeah. PE 1449. Preserving Independent Scottish Administrative Justice Council, since we last considered this petition, we have received submissions from the Chair of the Scottish Tribunals and Administrative Justice Advisory Committee, from the Convener of Accountability Scotland and the original petitioner. The Chair of the Advisory Committee gives assurances that the end user is well represented in the Advisory Committee. And I, I see we've got a note of all the members in the interim one. Are members therefore content to close this petition? petition? In doing so, do we wish to draw the Scottish Government the Advisory Committee's attention to the letters from Accountability Scotland and the original petitioner? Right, okie dokie. PE 1479, Legal Professional and Legal Aid Time Bar. Since we last considered this petition, the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission has proposed increasing the legal aid time bar limit from one year to three, with effect from 1 January 2015. The Commission is currently consulting on these changes, those changes, and the petitioner has been included in that consultation. The petitioner has indicated in his view there should be no time bar. Are members content to close this petition on the grounds that the time bar is being extended and the petitioner has had the opportunity to participate in the consultation? Alison. I think I'd be happier if we waited until the consultation had closed and we were able to um, just, just have a look at what the outcome of that is rather than prejudge uh, the consultation. And so I'd be happier to keep it open for just one more um, cycle if that was possible. I if you know it seems sensible to keep it open till after the 17th of November. I don't have a major problem if the committee wants to do that. But, uh, I have to say that the idea that there should be no time yes, bar for yeah. something like I think, is yeah. something I could never agree to. No, I, I'm, I'm in the same position as too, as yeah. well. I mean, one has to have some point of finality unless it's a, you know, a common law crime or something, which I think is no time bar. But I think otherwise one, one would have to have some kind of surety. Yes, we're happy to do that. OK, thank you. P1504 Civil Appeals. This petition was originally fertilised for consideration during our scrutiny of the Courts Reform Scotland Bill, which has now been passed. The committee previously wrote the petition to ascertain what the point of general public importance was in her case, not reasons were given by a solicitor for not representing her, a response is in Annex D. Do you have any comments on the petitioner's latest submission? Our members content to close the petition on the grounds the bill has now completed its parliamentary passage. Thank you very much. Uh, P1510, PE1511, they are referred to us during our session with the inspectors of fire and rescue in Constabulary in August. But these are issues which, of course, police and fire control rooms have arisen partly today. Um, so are you content to keep the petitions open for the time being because we can raise them when we're taking questions on the budget? Yes, okay, do okay, right. Item 8, subordinate legislation, is one negative instrument, the legal aid and assistance by way of representation fees for time at court and travelling Scotland regulations 2014, SSI 2014 257. This aims to bring in a consistent approach on how solicitors charge their time engaged at court across civil legal aid, criminal legal aid, legal aid and contempt of court proceedings, and advice and assistance for matters relating to assistance by way of representation. This instrument is due to come into force on 10th November 2014. The DPLR committee did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament on any grounds. Do you have any comments? I was pleased that uh, the Faculty of Advocates and uh, the Law Society of Scotland and the Board seem to be content. Well, bring out the cake. Yes, they are content for the time being. 
Item 9. We are content to make no recommendation in relation to this. Yeah. I've just said that. I content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument. Yes. I'm moving too fast for you. Um, now, item 9, subordinate legislation is one instrument not subject to any parliamentary procedure. Rules of the Scottish Land Court 20, 2014. SSI 2014 This sets out the practice and procedure to be followed in the Scottish Land Court with effect from 22nd September 2014. Seems a bit pointless if it's already there. The DPLR committee has, has drawn the instrument to the attention of the Parliament for minor drafting errors and a failure to follow the normal drafting practice. The DPLR committee also noted issues with the timing of the instrument. Are members content to endorse the concerns of the DPLR committee? John. A, a brief point, and that is on page six of our paper, paragraph two, in relation to the Scottish Land Court's response, which I found strange at best, unprofessional at, at worst, and, and where they say the general approach taken in drafting the rules was to use gender-neutral terminology, but as you will be aware, this can sometimes be cumbersome. <laughs> well, I don't think that's a, an appropriate response from a public body. I think all... all DPLR report has picked that up. Yes, OK. They don't miss much. Mm -hmm. So you're content to yeah, yeah, yes, endorse yes, the Yes, but I, I think it's worth saying that you, I, I, do, I would have yes. expected more from a public no, body no. in this day and age. Yeah. Right. That said, we now move into private session. <laughs>